Welcome to Mic Drop, the podcast where relevancy is irrelevant and we don't give a shit about your feelings. Ladies and gentlemen, it is both a distinct honor and a pleasure to welcome my next podcast guest to the microphone, Mic Drop Podcast. He was a U.S. Navy SEAL for 11 and a half years. He did three combat deployments. He's earned three bronze stars with Valor, one of which was recently upgraded to a silver star. He has an Army Commendation Medal with Valor from the 1st to the 506th in Ramadi. He's the owner of Never Settle Consulting, which is a leadership and now also apparel company. He's a leadership speaker and instructor and also the director of FTXs for Echelon Front. That's the company owned by Jocko and Leif. He is a husband and a father, and JP actually stands for ginormous, and that's with a J, package. And ladies, I can assure you, he is not fucking afraid to use it. Welcome to the stage, JP Donnell. <laughs> well, I will have to say that is one of the most unique introductions I've had. Appreciate you having me out here, bud. Well, I, I appreciate you making the time to come out. I know uh, after listening to the, the episode of you on, on Jocko, I figured there's no way I'm going to be able to to compete with a with a serious introduction uh, to the manner with which he did, so I wasn't even <laughs> going to fucking try it. But uh, yeah, I appreciate you coming out here. It's it's uh, it's amazing how many Texas frogmen there are nowadays, so awesome. um, and it's fucking great that uh, that you live as close as you do. We need to certainly need to take better advantage of that. But uh, absolutely. Um, one of the things uh, I like to start out with, well, first of all, uh, before I guess before we jump into the lightning round, is that you brought some uh, some Jocko tea and some Strike Force yes. Energy Gel Packs. I'm gonna I'm gonna christen this bitch right now. <laughs> I already and, had one on the way, but I'm gonna have another. And so uh, I know that I appreciate you bringing the goodies. And no, I'm not getting fucking paid to do this. So don't even start. <laughs> well, uh, if I would have had any of the the can discipline go from from origin they, those come out next month yeah. those are insanely good i, I would have brought those so, so I'm, I'm trying jocko tea with strike force lemon it's an arnold palmer right yes. a healthy arnold palmer. it's really good god damn i'm gonna get drunk off of that <laughs> all right it's good shit i appreciate you bringing yeah, it so absolutely. uh first i like to start out with just some bullshit questions and uh and then go from there but uh cool. do you have a dream car are you into cars uh, I, I do like cars. Um, but, uh, what's what's JP's dream car? A '69 Super Sport Camaro. Is that right? Yeah. What do you think of the the new the new ZL ones, the, the new Camaros? Those are pretty fucking bad. Yeah, they're awesome. They're legit. I just but they're not I a just, '69. I want an old muscle car. You yeah. know, we had when I was um, in high school, we had a '67 Camaro. You know, it was the first year of the, of the Camaros. Yeah. And absolutely loved it. Um, you know, parents ended up having to sell it and. Uh, I've always wanted. I've always wanted another. Just yeah. And I wanted to. Yeah, I wanted to be matte black. Just fucking it's mean. Gonna be legit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. That's good shit. Um, favorite cheat meal. <laughs> favorite cheat meal. Well, clearly I've been having a lot of those lately. <laughs> but um, I like to go with the family recently. I like to go to Chewy's. Oh yeah, uh, Mexican restaurant Mexican here joint, in Texas, yeah. and I get the Shirley's goo. It's just basically rice. Uh, there, there's a few different ways you could take that. Yeah, Shirley, yeah Shirley's exactly. goo. Is yeah, that yeah. what you said? It's I'm a, not sure if I want to taste Shirley's goo. Yeah, no, it's rice, <laughs> uh, fajita chicken, and uh, nacho cheese. No shit. Yeah, or it's their queso. Their ke not nacho cheese, queso. So you, you like the way Shirley tastes? Is that what yeah. you're saying? All right. Uh, what's your best hazing story from the teams? Or even echelon front. I don't know how you guys do it. You guys yeah, electrocuting no, really, each other. You no hazing. No hazing. Um, I think one of the fun, well, I mean, one of the funnier ones was when my first platoon, my sister platoon, Charlie platoon, they made one of their new guys. He would always. He was like a good looking guy, and he always got hit on by girls whenever we got on the road. And so to just to make that more difficult for him, they made him sh shave the top of his head but leave everything else, and he had to wear a hat. The old man halo? Yes, the old man halo. And then we'd be out of the bars or wherever, and if he was talking to some chick, they would like do Rip something. Down. And he, at that point in time, it didn't matter. He had to take the hat off and continue <laughs> on with the conversation. I always thought that one was hilarious. And then our second workup, um, they made Biggles carry a big, like, life-sized stuffed bear oh, with him out to the bar. Jeez and he Christ. always had to keep that with him at all times. Like the movie fucking Ted or whatever. That Something was. like that, yeah, except for the bear was <laughs> the size of, like, 
my kid like yeah. it was huge oh shit the uh with the with the fucking the halo story like with the right chick i think that would actually help him get laid you know, I mean, like if probably. she's got a sense of humor, that's kind yeah, of Yeah, she's got a sense of humor. But if she's hot, she probably doesn't have one. So. Yeah, it's most right. likely not. Uh, favorite pistol? Sig 226. Same Just one old, we carry. The old school. Is that what you're rocking most of the I time? I still have that. Oh, shit. That's all I carried, obviously, in the teams. Yeah. And then I got one for personal use. And, um, I mean, I've, I've shot hundreds of thousands of rounds through that one no over shit. the years and yeah. then i mean but now the the new sig 320 i have a full size and a compact i love that gun yeah and it was hard to go from the 226 to the 320 because i was just i mean the 226 is old faithful right yeah. she is yeah. an amazing gun reliable doesn't break i mean it's insane the amount of wear and tear i put through that gun and yeah. had no issues but one of the things um you know, I was talking with Dom Rosso, and he was talking about shooting and everything. He's like, that's why guys like the Glock and the 320 is, and this is years ago we talked about it, we're having a little debate back and forth, is your trigger pull is always going to yeah. be the same. Uh, it's the same yeah. every single time. So Yeah, I was just going to say, I, the, what I don't like, the only thing I don't like about SIG is the dual action. Like, you know, the... the the, the long long trigger and then the short one you know on single yeah. action it's just for me it, it after shooting a, a glock it just fucks me up but i get it yeah and a lot of people don't you know but there's ways to eliminate that like you're doing presentation shots so you know you bring your gun out you bring it up eye level and as you're you know presenting and pushing driving that weapon out towards a target you're also taking the slack out yeah. if you do that enough times you're not on target and that's what screws people up is they wait to until they're on target to start pulling the trigger yeah and that's what that's what the issue is but i, I obviously understand that you can be more efficient faster more effective yeah. with the 320s or yeah. or the glocks yeah i mean for me i guess i i when i did a little bit and i didn't do much i did a little bit of contracting work as i was getting out and uh teaching a little bit of pistol and rifle um and a lot of the guys that uh that um that i was working with shot glocks and and uh you know getting some some tutelage from those guys that had been contracting for a few years and, and had some some pretty handy fucking tips like i was sold I, I, I was transferred straight over the glock and really haven't looked back since i've tried a, a number of other platforms but i just i mean to me like the glock 19 you just can't fucking beat it you they're know? not but, bad guns yeah but uh most humiliating time or story as a seal hmm Jeez. Um, second platoon doing our workup, getting ready to deploy to Ramadi. I go back home on leave. I get arrested up in Reno for fighting. <laughs> yeah. That's a shocker. Yeah. You? Yeah. Put some dude in the hospital. Um, yeah, I, I dove in that story on other podcasts more deeper but um you know i was i was defending my buddies and myself you know I, i've never gone out looking for fights you know but um I, I also just wasn't that one you know i definitely should have just chose a different route right you know yeah. just whatever um i was very lucky i didn't end up in legitimate like deeper shit jail for a year yeah the guy had to have like was in the hospital for a long time like they're they're uh, wanting to do aggravated assault charges against me for what I did yeah. to the guy. Um, did but you tell him luckily I wasn't was aggravated. Well, about it. Uh, yeah, I wasn't aggravated <laughs> at all. I was actually calm. But no, the guy was, the guy came at us, he attacked us, he had a bottle in his hand, and yeah. you know, that was my kind of like my saving grace. Um, but that wasn't humiliating. The command was like, all right, cool, whatever, we'll, we'll fix this. Yeah. What was humiliating is 11 days later, I go home on leave for Christmas leave, and I get a DUI. Holy fuck. Yeah. So now, well, it was a wet and reckless, right? And well, so no, it was a DUI. It got, I got it down to a wet and reckless. And so I have to come home off of Christmas leave. And I am driving back to San Diego with knots in my stomach. I'm like, I'm done. Yeah. Like I am, I am complete. I am out of the Navy. Like this is, and I was also, I was humiliated and embarrassed for the fact that I had to go tell my leadership that, hey, I know you guys just had my back when I got in trouble. I went out and screwed up again, yeah. you know, and I look back at now being 35 and then I was 22. It's like, dude, what the heck? Yeah. And so that was probably the most humiliating is having to go tell your leadership that I just got arrested again for a DUI when yeah. I, I could have, there's so many other options. No, I know. Well, so, I mean, having spent enough time in the SEALs community and seeing other guys go through that, how the fuck did you get out of that? <laughs> My leadership 
My late, I mean, Jocko was my task unit commander. Seth Stone was the our platoon commander, our LPO in chief. You know, and you know we had I had good le- senior leadership at the command as well. And you know, I went and told them what happened. And you know, I remember the look at on all my leadership, but especially like Master Chief Presson. Mm-hmm. And he was he was just like, damn it. Yeah. I mean, he just. Damn it, Bobby. He, well, you know, Preston's a good old boy from Texas, and he was like, "Damn it, young man." He goes, I "Expected more from you." Yeah. That. Oh yeah. Dude, that. Disappointed. I'm not me. mad. Yeah, that crushed me. Yeah. And the rest of my the rest of my leadership as well, and they said, "Okay, well, we're going to see what the outcome is." Yeah. And um, and so I ended up having to go do a uh, at a chief re- review board to see if I got to keep my trident. And I was a couple rooms over, and at the time they're doing remodeling at SEAL Team Three, and I could hear them talk. Luckily, I could hear them talk, and they're like, "Hey, we're going to hammer him." But a lot of guys were like, "He's a good kid. Like yeah. we want him on deployment." He screwed up, blah blah. blah. And there's some like fleet chiefs that you know were attached to the command that were in that review board as well, and they're Which like, is "Bullshit." You know, they're like, <laughs> "Yeah," and they're Don't like, "Get me started." You know, they were like wanting to crush me. Yeah. And I remember like Master Chief Yarbo and other guys were like. Yeah, bros, the fuck shut up. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, no, this yeah. is you know, this is what's gonna happen. He's gonna pay the man for yeah. sure. And I did, and I was on a restriction for the whole rest of the time until we deployed. Yeah. And they basically were like, "Hey, we'll see how Ramadi goes for you, yeah. and then we'll readdress this when we come home from deployment." And I didn't know this until I was on Jocko's podcast, and he mentioned it. I guess he went to the command and was oh, the leadership, and basically was like, "I don't care what happens. He's coming on deployment. Yeah. Like it doesn't matter." And mm-hmm. so. Luckily, I had I just had good leaders that yeah. you know were like, hey, yeah, he screwed up, but we see value in what he can do in the teams. Yeah. Let's let's work with them. Well, to me, you know, good leadership is half of it. Yes, you know, because to me, like they don't they don't do that for an average dude either. You know, so I, I appreciate your hum- humility, uh, but you know, t- to me, that speaks volumes when you've got a guy like Jocko, a guy like Seth, rest in peace, yeah. um, you know, to, to go to bat for you in that manner and basically stick their fucking neck and reputation out on the line for you and say, you know, I don't give a fuck what he did. Like he's, he's that legitimate of a warrior. We're bringing him with us irrespective of, of what happened. I mean, that says a lot about you. So I well, mean, that, that's fucking good shit. I appreciate it. And you know, you, you know, when you said, you know, Seth's name, rest in peace, it, it's, it's sad with oh, him no. being gone because I mean, Seth was like my big brother in the teams, man. Yeah. Like he helped me become a young frog man. We we went through SQT together. We went yeah. to SEAL Team Three together. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you were our SQT instructor. Yeah. And um, I just he always did that for me. Yeah. He did that for everybody. That's just Seth was just that amazing of a guy where he yeah. was constantly. Um, looking out for guys and putting other guys first. I mean, that's what a, a real leader is like, yeah. you know, and that's, I'm so fortunate to do what I do with, with Jocko and Leif now. Um, I mean, cause they've always been servant leaders, right? Mm-hmm. Have they always been perfect leaders? No, that's the beautiful thing about what we do is yeah. we're constantly trying to improve and uh, improve those around us. And say, like, Hey, learn, learn from our lessons, learn yeah. from the mistakes we've made in, in the teams and combat and working with other companies and, you know, it's unfortunate because, you know, Seth would have been with us, you know, yeah. he, he was, if he would have still been alive, he'd be less than a year away from retiring. Yeah. No, and it's, it's fucking like, tragic. Yeah. No, no other way to fucking just skin that cat. Yeah. Uh, on a lighter note, what's the dumbest board game you've ever played? <laughs> the, the dumbest board game. Um, uh, I mean, well. I mean, from my standpoint, Candyland, but my daughters love it when I play with them, right? So yeah, that's fucking great. I guess that counters that out. So Candyland, I'm oh, like, whenever I play, I'm like, I'm just hungry. This is ridiculous. <laughs> like, oh, I got two gumdrops. Blue, yeah, I got the drum. <laughs> oh, I've got to go back to sorry, you know. But the yeah. dude, the the girls love it. So yeah. it's that's fucking priceless because that. Uh, not that you were probably going to ask, but that's for me. It's the same thing. Like my kids love that shit, but uh, it just makes me hungry and pissed off. <laughs> Um, all right, here's a here's a real barn burner. Do you like spam? No, it's disgusting. I, I grew up on fucking spam, and I, I did want to bring up, I'm not being paid by spam, but there is a museum in Austin, Minnesota, dedicated to spam. What? That's it's, one of the things I hate about my first deployment. We spent a little time in Guam before we mm. went over to Iraq. Guam and, and like Hawaii. You go to McDonald's to get breakfast, and they have spam, like yeah. grilled spam for breakfast. I, it's just like, Fucking spam. I, my, uh, my mom... God bless her. Um, 
in a pinch would throw spam with rice aroni together like spam and rice fucking i mean how's that for fucking you make it you know she always made it but uh that was god i hated that shit you know top ramen the we, yeah. we called them long noodles when we were kids. <laughs> yeah. we were like, oh, we want long noodles yeah. uh we were we were pretty i don't like to say poor anymore because what we've seen around the world like yeah poor is no, not poor per, yeah nobody but in this country compared to the united states right yeah. we, we, we were tight on yeah. our money yeah. growing up and we used to do long noodles and hot dogs so yeah. they would cook a hot dog in the yeah. microwave and then cut it up into little pieces and yeah. then put that in this uh, in the long noodles yeah. <laughs> yeah. breakfast to goddamn champion <laughs> that's no shit um all right and the the last question I, I have to ask everybody is what is your morning routine now i know you travel a lot so uh, you know, for the listener, if you could kind of break it down into a normal day when you're at home versus a normal day when you're on the road, what is, what is that? How, how does JP start his fucking day? Um, so normal day when I'm home, I start my day with, uh, my alarm going off and way too fucking early. No, I'm not, I'm not that, you're not the four thirty guy. No, I mean, I've, I've never been that yeah. now when I'm on the road and I need to be, or I'm doing stuff with echelon front. Absolutely. But Here's the thing, like people are like, oh, you're not getting up at 430 like Jocko and, and Leif. And I'm like, well, A, I'm not Jocko, I'm not Leif. And B, I'm up sometimes until one or two in yeah, the morning. I'm like, guess what? I'm not waking up in two hours or yeah. three hours, you know? Yeah. Um, so alarm goes off when it's time for us to start getting the kids ready for school. Uh, my, my wife is amazing. She, before I'm getting out of bed, she has a cup of coffee on the nightstand for me. Amen. So I, 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 I sit up in bed. <laughs> I sit in bed. And I, I, I scroll through my emails to see if yeah. anything like super important came through the night yeah. while I'm drinking my coffee and she's getting the kids ready. Yeah. And then I go to social media. I check my social media messages, like anything come through that I need to be aware of, you know, blah, blah, blah. So I'll check my Instagram because I have a much greater following on Instagram and interaction there. So I'll check my Instagram messages and then I'll check my Facebook business page. I'll check Twitter and then I'll check my regular Facebook. I just basically I'm scrolling through messages as you know, anything what's going on or respond to text messages from like, I have buddies that like to text me at two in the morning, you know, before you even piss. Yeah. 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 And then, (laughs) you know, and then, so then that's, that's what I kind of, I, I'll be able to get a good look at my gauge. Right. And then I, I look at my calendar on my phone, like, okay, what do I have today? You know, what's going on? Like, what do I need? Like, Oh, do I have a a conference call in five minutes? You know, you know, and so I'll go, I'll do all that stuff first. Uh, if I'm on the road, it's different. I, I I try to get a workout in uh, in the morning when I'm on the road. When I'm home, my family and I, that's our family time is we go to the gym together. We go to jujitsu together. So I don't go work out early in the morning when I'm home because I'm going to do that with my family. Now, yeah. if I'm on the road, I wake up, get a workout in, shower, and get going. I, I don't, I always have my clothes pressed and iron the night before yeah. because I've ran into times where the iron didn't work right and now you're trying to run down the front desk and get a new iron and yeah. or the iron has a bunch of gunk in it and it's all crappy and like so I always make sure my iron's clean I turn it on I hit the steam button a bunch of times to get all the crap yeah. out of there from yeah. other people god knows so i always prep the night before all my stuff for yeah. the next day some some twisted fuck shot a load in the fucking in the in the steam <laughs> steam iron for you uh no that's, that's fucking good advice i know uh you know just having your shit ready like i i do kind of a similar thing and like whether i'm traveling or here like even something as stupid as like setting out you know supplements or shit that uh-huh. i take in the morning like taking it out of the bottles and just setting it like i can just down it right away or whatever it but, drives my wife crazy because yeah. she doesn't like anything on the 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 countertop for in the bathroom by the sinks yeah i have all my stuff out yeah. right it's like hey <laughs> if it's out of sight and that's a problem though with me is if it's out of sight it's out of mind therefore yeah. i'm not going to remember to take my vitamins and supplements that i need to be taking no, if no. i don't see them so i put them yeah. out so it drives her crazy because she you know about once every three weeks she'll clean up all my stuff and put it under there within two days it's all back out there like, <laughs> i have it stacked up it's good yeah uh, that's fucking great what uh so in terms of childhood where where are you from so i grew up in sacramento california oh, shit. i actually grew up in the same house that my dad grew up in really yeah fucking norcal huh yep I, I, from your perspective uh you know there's like an, an an adage or a saying that you know live in new york but not so long to where you turn into an asshole live in northern california but not so long to turn into a fucking pussy or whatever huh i've it, never even heard that yeah and you're from there yeah 
Maybe I made it up. I don't yeah, know. Maybe you did. Uh, but I'm curious. Like I've been there a, a few times. It does seem like almost like fucking Disney World in terms of kind of the culture and, and how uh, laid back shit is. Like, uh, did that did that influence you or impact you growing up? I know it sounds like you came from a more meager means, but uh, you know, having traveled around the world and, and kind of looking back on it now as something to contrast it do you think that northern california uh ha- has that reputation for a reason or do you think it's kind of bullshit i've literally never heard that because really? like if i'm a dumbass I like no was, i mean northern california has everything like we have the mountains we have lakes we have rivers we have streams um you know we have farming you know i mean you go to my grandparents, which is 45 minutes away from where we grew up. I mean, they'll have snow, right? They have four mm-hmm. distinct seasons. My grandparents woke up and they would, you know, they had animals, you know, they had, you know, cows and horses and chickens and, you know, they had to get up early to go feed the horses. And so did you grow up fucking and, with them a little bit, like getting a mess with animals? And, yeah, 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 absolutely. You know, we'd go and grab the eggs from chickens and, yeah. you know, and, and that's what, you know, my grandparents ate. Now, my grandfather was an old farmer from Nebraska. He was in yeah. World War II. Um, so, and he did construction his whole life ever since he got out of the military. My dad did construction, but um, Northern California is very unique. You know, it has a just beautiful, beautiful land. Yeah. And so I think maybe, you know, that could be where that laid back attitude comes from. But I never, I mean, with all the traveling I've done, I mean, if anything's more laid back, it's where I lived in Mississippi in the South for a while when I got yeah. out because I was like super slow living, like yeah. slow pace, like, you know, there's no sense of urgency or, you know, people yeah. like just went through their daily routines. And yeah. um, so I, I've never really felt that from Northern California. I love to go back and visit, but I think also if you look at California as a whole, like just that state is just completely gone downhill yeah. from like the political standpoint oh, and all horrible. the laws and just every, I feel bad for my family that lives there, everything that they have to deal with. But yeah. you know, it's like Jocko, he lives <laughs> on the beach in san diego yeah. he, he ain't leaving <laughs> I, yeah i mean i don't know how fucking companies make it honestly especially starting out i mean it's one thing if you're an established you know enormous fucking corporation and, and you've got loopholes and whatever but like to start a small business in california no fucking way like no. there's no fucking way i would i mean that's the last place i would live but yeah uh, that, that boggles my mind that uh, that a lot of friends of ours you know stay there because of the weather and the, and the whatever but to each their own yeah. um in terms of your childhood, uh, siblings? Yeah, I have a younger brother, Corey, and a younger sister, Sarah. Uh, both of them grew up, them being my best friends. You know, we're all super close. Uh, Corey and I used to play Navy SEALs. He was actually the one that saw something about Navy SEALs first. And we used to watch, this, we had this documentary uh, that it was talking about JFK and how, you know, the, the SEAL teams were formed and the transition from the UDT teams over the SEAL teams. And, you know, we, we used to watch that every weekend, no right? Shit. We'd wake up and we'd have my mom put that in the VCR of what, what they recorded. And we were just infatuated with the SEAL teams. You know, we used to actually like tie up my sister as a hostage, <laughs> right? So she'd be in the backyard, like, like no shit, like tied up in a shed or to a tree. Oh, and Christ. we'd go rescue her. And we like one guy would play uh, the enemy and like, we'd go back and forth and we'd make my parents play Navy SEALs with us. Yeah. Like where they'd have to come find us. And we'd go to garage sales and get the old, you know, camis and old gear, the old H gear and the canteens yeah. and all that stuff from the old Vietnam vets. And, yeah. you know, it was funny. Um, I'm still reeling here thinking about uh, the issues your sister now has from being tied up. Fucking <laughs> well, she's actually job. doing good. You know, she's about a year away from being a neurosurgeon. Oh, no shit. So, yeah, she, yeah. Uh, she's got her, yeah, she's she going to go. Together, huh? Yeah, maybe she's like, I never want to, she's like, I want, I, you know, I'm going to make my brothers pay yeah. when I'm a neurosurgeon yeah, one no day, shit. which is good because then she can eventually evaluate my brain one day yeah, and just wonder she, she may have to. all the wear and tear is uh that's no shit is your is your younger brother um similar in terms of his background did he ever serve or yeah so he went into the military uh with a contract to go to buzz like i did like mm-hmm. just shortly after me uh Corey is one of the smartest people i've ever interacted with uh he was in second grade and was super bored in school it was like acing everything and they're like we think he should be tested right yeah he went t- tested and he was going to this rapid learner school for kids that were like gifted and like rapid learners. He was bored there as well. Jesus. Like that, yeah, I know. And so um, goes through that in elementary school. We go to junior high together. We're in high school together. 
uh, it was cool because my sister was a freshman, Corey was a junior, and I was a senior in high school. All very close. And um, he goes into the military, and he uh, scores the highest that you can on the ASVAB. And of course, there, you know, the recruiter's like, oh, you need to go to the nuke program. Yeah. You can become a nuke. We'll give you the signing bonus, and then you can become an officer, and then you can go to Buzz as an officer. Yeah. Like, they tried that with me, and I was like, no. Yeah. And then Corey, they were hitting hard because he was – through the charge on his testing and he's yeah. like no i want to go to buds like my brother like if not i'm gonna go find another recor- uh, another recruiter he's always been super like like no that's not what i'm doing like if you're not gonna help me screw you i'm like i try to like work with people and yeah. i don't want to hurt somebody's feelings <laughs> but i don't know Corey doesn't care and so we um anyways he's in a school um he's running on the beach doing the seal prep stuff with other guys tears his knee he's gonna have to have knee surgery so he gets pulled or not pulled but he's on hold so he can't go to buds injured um comes back on base with his buddies they've been drinking gate guards bust them for underage drinking and um and then the next day uh whoever was in charge like I can't remember like what it's called. You know, the barracks that we lived in a school, like they call them different ships and divisions, whatever. Um, Whoever like the LPO or the chief for that was trying to get him like, all right, who was with you? And he's like, it was just me. And they're like, who else was underage drinking with you? And Corey wouldn't say anything. And uh, it's crazy because some of those guys are in the teams at higher level commands within the teams. And I never knew that. We Mm -hmm. never knew that until couple of years ago my my wife and my dad were doing a catering for guys out at shaw's as they come through tra- training and they were catering their lunches and dinners uh so the guys didn't have to worry about food they literally just were able to focus on training and one of those guys was like talking with us and he i knew him mm-hmm. and so i introduced him to my dad and and wife and he goes your your son is the reason why i'm in the teams and my dad's like, hmm? And I even, I even I was like, what are you talking about? Yeah. What did I have to do with it? Yeah, and then he's like, no, Corey. And then he told the story that how Corey didn't roll on anybody. No shit. Took the brunt of the punishment, and then he got, and at the time, because he was young, it was just like one of those weird things with the military. You know, I guess he got uh, other than honorable admin separation from the Navy. Yeah. And so that was the end of his Navy career, which is Fuck, complete man. bullshit. Yeah. Uh, but things happen for a reason. He knows that. He understands that. It's the same with me. You know, I should have been other places in my career with the military, and I just wasn't there. And you know, things happen. Yeah. But uh, so he he he's one of those crazy dudes that climbs cell phone towers to reprogram them. (laughs) And he's a site foreman. So he runs all that stuff. So, um, yeah, you know, he jumps off of him. I've always asked him if I could. <laughs> that makes him nervous. But dude, like he he'll like FaceTime me sometimes up there just to say what's up because he's over like a huge value. He's so high over these valleys, you'll see helicopters flying below him. God damn. Like he, he has pictures of him and his buddies completely covered in snow and ice and they're up there trying to fix the cell phone towers and it's just like that's gotta insane. be a decent fucking living. Uh, yeah, I think so. I hope so. Yeah, okay. I'm always like, bro. I hope you're at least making this. To be. <laughs> and he, I mean, he he literally he'll work seven days a week for five six days or for five six weeks at a time. Jesus Christ! To get job sites done. Damn, that's fucking gnarly. Yeah, you ought to have him on the fucking show. Oh, dude, he that would be awesome. Yeah. He's he's a, he's a crack up. Um, all right, so he's doing that now. Your sister is about to be a fucking neurosurgeon. Yep, uh, and she's a mom and uh, a wife, and she also was doing uh, women's figure competitions. Oh, sure. You know, that's why I love when people are like, "Oh, I, you know, I can't do this," or they make excuses as they don't have time. And I'm like, yeah. my sister. This is before she met her husband. I was like, my sister was a single mom, working two jobs, doing personal training to make ends meet and did figure competitions and got second and third place like yeah. shut up <laughs> yeah. like, while, while she's was she going to school for oh yeah, yeah and going to school yeah. yeah yeah it's like insane jesus like how Christ. how do you do yeah, that and sleep like 30 minutes a day <laughs> maybe jesus uh yeah. how about mom and dad mom and dad are awesome i grew up with very good parents um like i said we didn't have a lot of money but that didn't matter that doesn't matter in life like yeah. that doesn't define like that you're gonna have a good life or not yeah. and we we my parents taught us to enjoy everything that we had you know yeah. and um you know, and then also they also taught us like you never allow another human being to dictate what you can and can't do. Mm-hmm. Like if you want something, go get it. Yeah. Get to work. 
Don't and steal it. But yeah, work, it. earn it, you know, yeah. and enjoy it. Yeah. And um, uh, yeah, they're just just great parents, hard workers. I mean, there's a lot of times I remember my dad, you know, working construction. You know, my mom taught step aerobics when she could outside of taking care of us kids. And my dad did um, did construction, you're yeah. right. So not, not a lot of money in the 80s and 90s mm -hmm. for that. But, you know, they always worked hard. And there was times where my dad would come home from working construction all day long, spend some time with us kids, my mom, and then he'd go work in a kitchen for a couple hours somewhere. Oh, shit. Yeah. And uh, some of those, like, 24-hour, like, like Denny's or whatever those yeah. places were back in there. Yeah. So. Is that something that you paid attention to as a kid, like, yeah. uh, and, and appreciated, like, God damn, my dad works his ass off. Yeah. yeah. Uh, just watching how hard both my parents worked. Yeah. I mean, there's times where my mom would wake us up super early and get us ready for school, but we would actually go to the gym where she was teaching the morning aerobics yeah. classes and we'd sleep in the office or we'd sleep in the daycare yeah. room. Yeah. And then she'd get us ready, drop us off at school and then go back and teach classes all day long, pick us up, we'd go, we'd spend yeah. time in the gym. And yeah, I mean, some people might like think, you know, what a, down, but dude, that was awesome. You nope. know what I mean? And it, yeah. it, I mean, that was my parents making ends meet. They didn't make excuses. They yeah. just made it happen always. And that's something I've, always remembered always looked at i mean and my father-in-law and mother-in-law were the same way with my wife you know yeah. growing up and yeah. that's one of the things i've always remembered is you know there's times in the winter time <clears throat> my dad had pneumonia and he'd be coughing up blood and he'd still have to go work mm -hmm. and frame eight ten twelve hours a day out in the cold because yeah. guess what if he didn't work we didn't get paid yeah and so it's just yeah but yeah, to me, I think you know a lot of parents, especially nowadays, with you know as as comfortable as a society that we live in, I think have it just plain fucking wrong. Is that you know they they try to um, you know coddle and and protect their their kids and and you know give them so much uh, from a resource and and you know attention standpoint that it, it not only spoils them, but I think it teaches a shitty example. Yeah. I mean, to me, to, to hear that story that you share about, uh, you know, what your mom did with you, I mean, it, to me, if I'm putting myself in the child's shoes and, and, and understanding, you know, how sponge-like children are and how much they, uh, you know, view and, and pay attention and absorb things uh, that their parents do, I mean, that that's the biggest teacher is watching what their parents do. Mm -hmm. and if, you know, if you've got parents that spoil you and fucking lay around and watch TV and whatever, like, you're going to emulate that, you know? Yeah. And to me, like, I know there's there's a lot of times where people look down on, on situations like that or say, you know, that's fucked up that you're dragging your kids. But, like, to me, like, that's the best upbringing you can have, you yeah. know, because it, it teaches discipline. It teaches hard work. It teaches, you know, you do whatever the fuck you have to to, to make things happen. And there's just not enough of that, yeah. you know, I, I don't think. It's cool because I... When Amanda and I moved out here, we found a gym to do jujitsu, and my wife started training, which was so awesome. Just you know, have my wife in the game, and uh, another reason and it, to choke her out, right? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and uh, she got hurt, and well, she didn't. She had been dealing with an injury for about ten years, and it just flared up again. It was her back, and, right? Uh, well, it's her back and her and her like neck as well. You know, she had some issues with that, so she had thoracic outlet syndrome. Uh, TOS and it, uh, hers was vascular and neurological so they actually had to r remove her first rib holy fuck yeah and so but <clears throat> you talk about things lining up and just God being awesome and putting us in the right place like we were trying so hard to be in the flower mound area mm -hmm. so hard like because um, uh, just for some other reasons I, I'm not going to get into talking crap on another company yeah. on, on a podcast, <laughs> but I was trying to be in that area to help with a, uh, with a indoor training mm -hmm. gun store, CrossFit yeah. uh, places all under one roof. And I was going to, I want to be in that area so I could kind of help assist with some of that stuff. Yeah. Um, a frogman brother of ours, Dan Licardo yeah. was, was there. And so I was really tr trying to be in that area. Ended up finding a house out in the Keller Roanoke, uh, North Lake area, yeah. right? And so, all right, cool, whatever. Well, so I'm like, well, I, I want to find a gym to do jujitsu. Reach out to this guy named Ivan. Uh, he's, you know, does a lot of combatives training with the SEAL teams. He's a black belt under Hoist Grace. He runs Hoist Gracie's uh, business and, and stuff like that. And I was like, hey, man, do you know any good gyms in the area? 
He's like, yeah, Travis Luter, he's down in Fort Worth. Travis Luter, arguably for a long time, was one of the top three guys in the world for jiu-jitsu. Yeah. Anytime he corners a fighter in the UFC, Joe Rogan's all about Travis Luter. He's yeah. like, he's the best, he's the best. You know? So I was like, well, I know who that guy is. He's legit, but yeah. that's a 50-minute drive from where we live. And then he's like, hey, check out this guy. Paul Halame has a gym, uh, gym peak performance. MMA. I was like, okay, cool. So we went and checked it out. Turns out that Paul and one of his other black belts actually came to the muster that we had in Austin no shit. Um, earlier that year yeah. and uh, to check out what we we're doing with Echelon Front. So it just worked out great. It's 15 minutes from the house. We start training there. A man is having those issues. They're like, hey, one of our black belts also works at this physical therapy uh, facility. You should go check it out. You know, blah, blah, blah. Tell them you're with Peak. They'll take care of you. So we go there. Well, they were the only place in the last 10 years to actually properly diagnose Amanda. Everybody else was like, oh, you have a herniated disc in your neck. You're going to have to have neck surgery. Like, hey, you have a herniated disc. We're going to do injections. Like, they did all this stuff. Nothing worked. We go there. They find out that it's TOS. And it turns out the, the number one TOS surgeon in the nation is based out of Dallas. No oh, shit. And so he, the, our, our doctor, Dr. Frith, and, 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 and Dan, they reach out to this doctor and they're like, hey, like this is what's going on. She's in a lot of pain. We need her in. And they got, got her in for surgery like that. And That's so she had nice. surgery. And now she's just recovered just now to start training again. And she's yeah. still in a lot of pain. You know, yeah. It's going to take probably another year to be recovered because, I mean, think about it. Her body's been dealing with that for 10 years. Yeah, it's like so adapts to it. Yeah, and yeah. so her muscles are all messed up. Her like her rear scapula doesn't fire. Like it's hard for her. Like she can't like do what I'm doing by pulling my shoulder blades back. Yeah. She can't do that without having pain. Uh, yeah. Like can breathing imagine. hurts, yeah. like breathing hurts for her. God damn. And I feel like an, an asshole husband because there's times where I'm just like, really breathing hurts. Like, come on. You know what I mean? I was just <laughs> like insensitive prick. Well, yeah, I was because I just, for me, I couldn't, I, it was really hard for me to comprehend yeah. that. And yeah. then as we learn more and, to see how tough she is is just insane. And yeah. so um, that's got to be difficult, you know, and seeing the the mother of your kids go through that and and trying to juggle, you know, with your schedule and being gone and having to deal with all that shit. I mean, that's a lot. Gone all the time. Yeah. I mean, it was and it was really hard. Yeah. It was really hard. I mean, I I love my wife, you know, like, yeah. and so uh, to see her dealing with all that and go with the pain and uh, even now there's still times where she's just like, you could just tell she just wore out. Yeah. And it's just frustrating, sure. uh, but she's back on the right path. It's awesome, and you know, our kids love doing jujitsu. And we'll be at the gym, and Amanda's now starting to train again. And it's the same thing, you know. We went off that tangent about her injury, but where I was going with that is, we have the kids at the gym with yeah. us, right? And even yeah. when they're done with their kids' class, they're at the gym watching and being around. And guess yeah. what? Their friends are other kids whose parents are in the gym. So yeah. like this, their circle of friends and influence. That's that's where we want our kids to be making friends in the gym. Kids yeah. are on the right path. Their parents are obviously in the game when it comes to health and fitness and taking mm -hmm. care of yourself. And to have, I have twin daughters who are, who are beautiful, even if they weren't beautiful. I have daughters. My daughters will not be a victim. Yeah, ever. Yeah, I can promise you that yeah. like I refuse to allow that. And then them doing jujitsu has built up their confidence. Aiden. His confidence has gone through the roof. Uh, he, I mean, he's turning into a young man, yeah. and, and it's because of you know him yeah. getting older and because of the foundation that jujitsu has laid. And the instructors there for the kids program are insane. Yeah. Like with me being gone all the time, that that that's the other male figures that my kids need. Sure. And I, I, it, men need to be in their kids' lives. Mm -hmm. Men need to be in other kids' lives, and yeah. that's why I told all those guys there. I'm like, hey, I'm gone all the time. I expect you guys to be hard with my kids. Yeah. I don't, they are not going to be given anything. I actually want to be harder for my kids to advance and get promotions than anybody else in the gym because yeah. I want them to learn those hard lessons. Yeah. And they're all like, okay, cool. Like, yeah. No, it's fucking great. I mean, that, that adage, it takes a village. You've heard of that one, right? Uh, yes. Yeah, I have heard that one that uh, you made up. No, just yeah, the other fucking one you pulled out of your ass. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, for sure. Like, you know, the, the whole toxic masculinity bullshit that, that gets spewed out there all the time. I mean, like, for sure, there's, a, there's a, a balance and a happy medium like there is with anything. But, you know, without a doubt, like, men are men for a reason. Women are women are, 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 women, are women for a reason. And, and there's elements to both components of, of a parent 
and just other external influences that kids fucking need to see yeah uh you know from multiple sources to to get that good balance i think and that's great to hear you know there um i've done a couple of podcasts where we've talked about it. i was actually on a podcast called order of man yeah yeah, yeah. and so with yeah, ryan ryan's, he, ryan's awesome dude he's got a great thing that he's doing yeah and actually just before we started this my buddy sal forsella who is a president of first form nutrition mm-hmm. i was on his brother's podcast andy forsella the mf ceo project yeah and because since then sal and i have become very close buddies like sal is one of my very close bros and he's getting ready to be on ryan's oh, podcast nice. and that's yeah. what he's calling me about and it's just sad when you look around at society and see how men think it's okay to be weak oh, and no. passive no yeah. men are supposed to be bold and courageous and yeah. you know i just i got on amazon the other day because i was talking with a guy about you know he's raising his boys and he's like man i just it's hard you know and i was like yeah raising kids is gonna be hard it's never gonna be easy and especially boys, you know, men need to raise their boys to become men. And how do you do that? And so there's a really good book called Wild at Heart. Mm-hmm. And so I got on Amazon, I ordered five of those, and I've already given out all five to okay. other guys that have boys. And I'm like, read this book. Yeah. And one of the guys from the gym that I gave to, I guess him and his wife scanned through it, and his wife was like, please tell him thank you. Yeah. Because that's not... So think about that. Like, it's so rare that somebody... Like he said, his wife was so appreciative of that. Like, how sad is that for our society? Oh, it's pathetic. It, yeah, no, it, I'm, I'm, toxic masculinity. Give yeah. me a break. The issue is lack of testosterone in no, males. No, for sure. No, I know it. I mean, and, and the, the, to me, the bitch of it is, is that you know, it's it's it, it's it's essentially the the when it's convenient. It's like I want you to be an emasculated, spineless fuck when it suits you know society yes. but you know but then oh hey also like when there's a terrorist attack feel free to th- to fucking thwart that also it's like <laughs> well hang on a minute you know like you, you can't have it fucking both ways you know it's like holding the door or, uh, i mean just on a on a episode i did just a, i don't know a week or two ago there was a there was a story about um you know and this pertains to quote unquote women's rights but um, you know, in wanting to be treated the same, it's like, but it's only when it's convenient, you know, and that shit pisses me off and I'm not advocating or condoning, you know, physical violence towards women or anybody no. un- unwarranted. However, you know, there was a story about a, a, um, it was a football player that, you know, like shoved a woman in a, in a hotel, hmm. uh, hallway or something. And, and then, you know, pushed her with his foot and they said, kicked her or whatever. I mean, you see the video and it's pretty, pretty lame, frankly, but uh, but my point is, like, this dude lost his job, like, goes on an apology fucking tour, you know, all of these, you know, sports analysts and whatever, are just motherfucking him up and down. And it's like, on the, in, this, in the same society that, that thinks or wants, desires women to be on an equal playing field in sports and special operations and all these other things, if that was a dude, like, it wouldn't have even made the news. Mm-hmm. You know, like, so, you know, to me, like, that's that's one element of it. But I think it, it, it speaks to a broader problem that our society has and that there's like to, to be a, a, a white fucking man in this country, like people are like, oh, what do you have to bitch about and white privilege and whatever. But like nobody could give less of a fuck what you and I think than any other group of people on the planet. Yeah. You know, like, you know, in terms of like you have no reason to fucking have any grievance or bitch or concern about anything and, and nobody gives a shit. And, and to have that that mentality of, of take, 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 except when I need something very specific, I think, uh, is, is why our country has, uh, you know, escalated to the point where Gillette has a fucking, you know, campaign telling people to shave, you know, because it's uh, it's the fucking, you know, being, being a real man is not being a man anymore. Like, it's just, it's fucking disheartening. It's disgusting. Yeah. I mean, the fact that Gillette would... <sighs> No, if, I mean, to me, me it's break. like, yeah, I get it. You're trying to get people to buy your shit to shave, but that's the wrong fucking way to do it. I'll tell you that. Like, I, I won't buy Gillette anything anymore. Anything. Like, yeah, I, I, and I do because I shave. Because guess what? We have we have to shave at Echelon Front. You What's know the what fucking mean? deal with that? I don't, it's, you know, Jock, Jocko and Leif. Hold <laughs> can he the not line. grow a beard? Is that what it is? Oh no, they can. They can grow legit beards. Yeah. And I always joke with them. I'm yeah. like, hey, can I get a can I get a no shave chick? Because <laughs> I'm gonna be up in Michigan, yeah. working outside in the low teens, yeah. doing these field training exercises that I run. Uh, can I get a no shave chick? And then Jocko's always like denied <laughs> dang it come. and then i'll just joke around i'll be like but i got the bumps you yeah, know yeah. like you know guys in the military the would do like hey yeah. I, I can't shave because i get bumps <laughs> and it's gonna cause scars and 
fucking um, crazy. Yeah, so, you know, whatever. I mean, we shave. I, Is there a reason it, it for no it? Or? Different. It makes no difference. Just to look clean cut and yeah. squared away like we were in the military. You know, yeah, that's just you know, that's the way Jock was always rolled and yeah. Leif, and I, I dig it. You know, trust me. I mean, there's times where I'm just like, man, I really want to just grow yeah. out a beard. But yeah. who cares? At the end of the day, <clears throat> you know, to the other flip side of that is having a beard doesn't define you as a man, you know? And then guys will go to this other Jurassic route. It's like, oh, I got this big ass beard and everything. It's like, yeah. so what? Yeah. Like guys just, guys don't understand what being a man really is anymore. And, and yeah. it's sad. Yeah. And the fact, you know, Amanda doesn't work uh, a, a job, but she takes care of our family and she runs our family. Yeah. And that is so incredibly important for her to be able to do that. And so people like will look at her like, oh, you don't work? Yeah. Like that's a bad thing. And I'm like, do you understand what she does? Yeah. No, she works. She works her ass off. She works more than me. Yeah. Her her job is much harder. You know, she makes sure the kids are squared away at school, kids are squared away with jujitsu. Yeah. I'm squared away with all my travel, all my work trips, you know, conference calls, everything. I work from, you know, I have a home office. You know, she does everything so that I can do what I do and we yeah. can have the life that we have and provide for our kids and help others and serve yeah. others. It, it's just ridiculous where people are. Yeah. I mean, to me that like, that's, that's the, uh, the way it ought to be. And it's not, you know, like I, I always kind of laugh or, or honestly feel bad for people that, that, uh, you know, go so far the other way of, of like, it reminds me of the Jeff Goldblum quote in uh, Jurassic park, like, in terms of of redefining traditional roles and everything so so much to the point where like it it gets to where people are just doing things for the sake of doing them you know or or to to see if they can push the envelope this fucking far in terms of women doing this or men doing that or or whatever and and uh, the, the the quote is to the effect of you know we've spent so much time and energy trying to figure out whether or not we could or couldn't, we never stopped and thought, should we, you know, and, and, uh, you know, and and that's relating to bringing fucking dinosaurs back. But to me, like on a broader scale, when you look at, at, uh, you know, human nature, uh, and the, and the globe as a whole, historically, you know, for the last couple thousand fucking years, you know, there, there's a reason why the, the family has been, uh, organized, designed and, and run and operated, the way that it has, you know, like when you look at cultures that are, are historically much more poor, there's none of that. Like, well, women can, you know, and, and men can have kids too, and they can stay at home. Like, <laughs> yeah, they can, you know, but like to me, like fucking scientifically, biologically, like it's supposed to fucking be that way. Like it, it's been that way and not because men just got together and had some secret society meeting and said, yeah, let's, Let's be the, the fucking providers and protectors and keep women in, in the house. Like, it'll be a big joke on them. Like, you're talking about thousands of years of, of biologically appropriate, you know, setups in terms of how, how families are organized. Like, yeah. I, I don't get why people are so hell-bent on fighting that. Like, it's not a bad thing. You know, I mean, that, that's how it works. People, anyway. There's just people out there that just want to argue, just argue. Yeah. I mean, I just, I look at you know, some of the politicians at some of the stuff they say, I just, I wonder if they truly feel that way or if they're just arguing just to argue or if they legitimately have mental issues. Yeah, I I mean, I think both sides uh, of the aisle, I would say, you know, liberals are are historically more, more or um, further guilty of it than than probably uh, conservatives in in most ways, but, um, you know, do things just because it's it's against what the other side believes yeah, or wants or, or whatever. I mean, the wall is a classic example. Like, I don't know how you argue against it. You know, I really don't. Like, to me, the, the fact that it's even a fucking issue is mind-boggling to me. Like, fucking put one up, you know? Like, I don't know. Like, there's, there's walls everywhere, you know? <laughs> Why? Because they fucking work. Yeah. You know, I just, I don't know. To me, I don't, I don't know how that's even a fucking issue. But anyway, we'll get to that uh, towards the end. Back to, uh, just real quick... In terms of your your Navy career, was there a specific influence um, that kind of drove you to to join and serve uh, outside of just kind of the um, you know the the deal with your brother kind of stumbling onto it and, and introducing it to you? Was there was there kind of an external influence? Um, so one of my uncles was a uh, pararescue. He was a PJ. Uh, he was actually a Tier One PJ. And oh, sure. So yeah, I did a lot of a uh, lot of a lot of work with our with our brothers out yeah. east. Um, and so, didn't, but didn't really know much about that because 
he was a true silent professional and never really talked about. Yeah. I never understood why he had a beard, yet he was in the military. And then yeah. I got in the military and I was like, oh, <laughs> yeah. okay. He was one of those guys. Yeah. Check. Yeah. Um, but it was mostly just, you know, listening to stories from my grandparents. Like both my my mom's dad and my dad's dad were both in the military in World War II. Uh, and just hearing those stories about the military and service and just what I thought I knew about the SEAL teams. But it wasn't any like one individual that I knew was a SEAL. It's not like I knew a SEAL growing up and I was like, I want to be like him. Yeah. I just knew enough about the military just, that I just like, man, I, just, I was just drawn towards the SEAL teams. Yeah. No, I, uh, I hear you there. Uh, in terms of that career, you came, what, what year did you come in? So I was in boot camp September fifth, two thousand one. No oh, shit. And then six days later, nine eleven happens. What uh, what was that like being in such an isolated environment, uh, such as boot camp, while that happened? Like what? what it was crazy. You, I mean, it was. So I remember I was standing by my my bed, or you know, the rack. Yeah, that's what we call them. Bunk or whatever. Yeah, fuck. your bunk. No, it was your rack. Yeah, everyone by the rack. And so I was standing by my rack, and the door slams open. And uh, it was in a senior chief. He walks in. Everyone calls attention on deck, on deck, whatever else he said, like something about senior chief. Uh, and then he just is like, you know, he says something to the effect of, "Hey, our nation's been attacked. We don't know what's going on next." And that was it. And leaves, and we're like, "What? Like, what do you mean our nation's been attacked? Like, is this like Pearl Harbor again? Like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I was like." You know, all these thoughts are going through my mind, and then we find out, we've, and then we're told what happened, and we said, you know, base is on lockdown, we're going to war, God and you're damn. just like, rock and roll, yeah. you know, like, I just knew for myself, obviously, I wasn't thrilled that that happened, I was, I was furious, I was upset, you know, I, I you know, I felt just love for my country and rage at the same time like yeah. just for whoever did that i wanted to make them pay yeah. i wanted to kill every single one of them yeah and i just wanted to get out of boot camp and get to buzz and go overseas but then i started in my mind calculating how long it was going to be i'm like that is war even still got going a couple years on like, yeah, yeah exactly you know in my yeah. mind i was like man maybe i can cross transfer over the marine corps yeah. you know because you know as soon as i get done with yeah. boot camp i'll be over there those guys are legit yeah. and so uh they're always headed into combat oh and, 300 uh, infantry you made it yeah <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah that would have been awesome but um uh, you know so i just you know it was crazy base was on complete lockdown yeah. and uh there was just a lot of a lot of uncertainty but yeah. i i just knew like i knew where i was going and it was I think like right within a couple of days, like the the guys come in, they're like, all right, everyone drop down, blah, blah, blah. Everyone's in a push-up position. They're like, where's my seal wannabes? You know, guy, you know, stand up. And so guys are like, stand up at attention. And I'm still in the push-up position. And they're like, they're going through and they're like, Danelle, where are you at? Like, Who ya? And they're like, aren't you, aren't you contracted to become a seal? Or go to buds, and I said yes. They're like, "Why aren't you standing up?" And I was like, "Cause I'm not a wannabe. I'm a I'm a gonna be." <laughs> and so I just remember I was just like that's super cocky, legit. right? Yeah. I'm 18 years old, uh, but I, I knew that I knew. Like yeah. I knew that that's what I was going to do. Yeah. And um, I thought it was like a test, also like where's the wannabes? Because when I went into the recruiter's office, uh, I had some issues getting in because I had a cast on my hand. And they said, you know, the SEAL wannabe recruiter is will be back in two days. You can come talk to him. Dude, that pissed me off. Yeah. I was like, I ain't doing this. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, so, you know, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. And so when I was in boot camp, they're like, where's all the SEAL wannabes? I just stayed in the push-up position. Yeah. And then I was That's like, I'm not a wannabe. Brilliant. I'm a going to be. <laughs> That's great shit. God damn, I love it. Um, all right, so you graduate boot camp. You go, yep. uh, go to my A school. A school. What A school were you? I was a whole technician. Oh, shit. Yeah. Call them turd chasers <laughs> in the Navy. So, you know, I did it because of uh, you, you learn a skill to weld, right? At yeah. the time, you had to have a SEAL source rating. Yeah. And I was like, what do these guys do? Uh, I was like, what's the shortest A school that'll get me to buds ASAP? Yeah. Other than Yeoman. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> um, and so HT, the whole technician, was a decent size, a decent distant uh, length A school. But they did pipe fitting, bending, sheet metal work, welding, all that that's stuff. Useful shit. And I was like, yeah, yeah, that's useful. That's awesome. That's a screw. And I wanted to impress my grandfather. I wanted yeah. to have this skill set because he did construction and, you know, he had to do a lot of all that same stuff, you know, growing up on a farm and the property that he had in Northern California, like still to this day, I mean, my grandfather passed away, you know, 
miss him, rest his soul, rest in peace. But my grandmother still lives there. The house is still heated by a wood burning stove. Yeah. You know, the water comes from a well. You know, he, I had to do a lot of work on his property, you yeah. know. And so I just remember that. I was like, man, if I could go help him, if I could weld, that would be cool. So that's why yeah. I chose that A school. Yeah. And then uh, after A school, went to Bud's, checked into class 242. Um, I Fucking remember pipe hitter class. Dude, it was <laughs> yeah, a, lot, a lot of good dudes in that one. Yeah, so it was. It was. I mean, yeah, a Congressional Medal of Honor recipient Ed Byers. Yeah, was in our buds class. You yeah. know, and uh, it was just. I remember checking in there April April twenty sixth, uh, two thousand two. Yeah, and then uh, classed up, and uh, the rest is history. Uh, yeah. The only evolution I failed in buds was the tread. And then at the time that was when remember when they went from the duck feet to those big those big oh, like dive yeah. fins yeah. that nobody could tread yeah. with those yeah. and so every everyone fails the tread yeah. and then the the next time we got to go back the next day we did we got to do the retest on the tread uh, they let us wear the duck feet and yeah. uh, so I passed the, the second time breakers. I was so pissed off because I wanted just to pass every evolution the first yeah. time but yeah, yeah only one I I failed and then SQT. Uh, but what was cool is like, I mean, you were an SQT instructor during this time and you know, you guys were coming back from deployments with actual combat knowledge yeah. and that's what was changing. Like buds was starting to kind of shift, but buds doesn't really teach you much about being a seal, you yeah. know, maybe third phase, maybe dive phase. Yeah. They're going to teach you some diving stuff. Yeah. SQT is where you're actually teaching yeah. guys how to be a frogman. It's all the advanced stuff. Buds is, uh, I tell people it's just a really long interview Oh yeah. because at any point in time you can be shit canned from training. Yeah. If any point in time they realize you can't lead you're done. Yeah. That's what they're looking for, especially yeah. in the officers. But even the enlisted guys, like, hey, is this guy a team player? Yeah. Can he step up and lead? You know, mm -hmm. I remember in third phase, um, we were doing a swim, and one of the guys had to pass the swim. And so we start off on the swim, <laughs> and I switch swim buddies. Like, I told my swim buddy, who was an officer, because we always came in, like, first, second, or third, like, hey, go with so-and-so. I'm going to swim with this guy because he's got, like, I'm going to drag him. You know, he's got to, you know, I'm going to push the pace. And so we do that. So we come back through. Of course, the instructors find out and I get pulled into like third phase. You know, uh, the instructors are like, you know, blah, 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 what's going on? And I remember it was, um, I don't know if I can say his name, but he's a warrant officer. And he's like, what happened? Why'd you do this? I said, well, because I knew this guy needed to be pushed on the swim and I could, you know, I, I've passed everything, you know, and I'm a strong swimmer. And so I told my swim buddy to switch with him and I went with him he, and he was like, so you're telling me HT3 Donnell told an officer <laughs> this and you made the decision out there that you were going to make this. And I said, absolutely. Yes, sir. He goes awesome get out of <laughs> sure. here and it was just you know i thought yeah. i was gonna get hammered but he that's what they want they yeah. want to see guys stepping yeah. up and thinking outside the box and going mm -hmm. you know does this is this really that big of an issue right now no that what we're doing right now is not right let's fix it like yeah. let's let's look out for others yeah. and then sqt it's what's like hey now we're actually learning to shoot move communicate and yeah. do all the awesome stuff yeah you know as an instructor one of my favorite things to do um was exactly that was to be like hey you know who's the junior man of this boat crew or squad or whatever and you know some fucking 19 year old yep. will raise his hand and be like all right you're fucking in charge now and they're like yeah <laughs> you know but but doing that on a regular basis like you know one is it, it you know if if every fucking asshole in the class knows that at any given time you may have to run the show yep. you're constantly thinking about it you're engaged you know and, and so like to me like for you know all you assholes out there listening that run anything uh like i can't encourage that enough you know, within your, your pipeline of people that work for you is to mix that up a little bit, obviously not to the detriment of your business, but, mm -hmm. uh, but do exercises where if it's something that's, you know, maybe a little less important or, uh, you know, there's something where, you know, you've got a little bit of wiggle room in terms of productivity, put somebody else in charge that, that has no idea that they're going to be put in charge. And by doing that, it forces all of your, your employees, you know, or if you're a coach with athletes, I mean, fucking, you, you know, you name it to always be thinking like, okay, well, if I was put in charge, how would I run this? And, and it just, I, I think it makes everybody more productive by doing that. You well, know? Because you're giving them ownership. Yeah. You want your guys to take ownership, give them ownership. Yeah. Cause I mean, we're just raised and in, ingrained in, 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 into our minds of, well, 
you know, there's always a chain of command in everything in life. Mm. And that is true. Yeah. However, do not allow that to hinder you from stepping up and, and leading, yeah. you know, and you have to, and Jocko knew that he realized that. And he knows that's a bad thing in society, especially in the military, right? Yeah. Like, Hey, I'm an E4. I don't, I don't speak up because my E5 knows to do the right thing. Yeah. And, you know, he came in and he gave us ownership. He yeah. gave us that mindset by saying, Hey, I want you to take ownership. I want you to own everything that affects the mission. Everything yeah. that affects us as a task unit, you're going to own no excuses. Like there, there is absolutely no excuses Yeah. because we're going to own it. Yeah. And so by you doing that as an SQT instructor, it forced us to step up and lead. And we knew, Hey, at any point in time, we could be put in a position of leadership at any point in time. Hey, guess what? If my chief gets killed on a mission and I'm the next up, like I need to know what to do. I need to be able to step up and as I step up, guess what everybody else to do? Mm -hmm. They have to step up in their levels of, of leadership as well. Yeah, yep, absolutely. All right, so speaking of um, deployments and uh, you know combat missions, not just simulated and training for leadership purposes, but actually now you check into SEAL Team 3. Um, one of the neat things about the, the time that I was an instructor is like looking at, at the, the crew of of fucking dudes that that went through um that time and then you know the, the mid 2000s you know oh oh four to fucking oh nine like yeah. oh oh nine oh eight like that that block of time like holy fuck you know for the community i mean it's just it, it's reminiscent of the stories from vietnam you know like yes. the mid 60s type of thing when it was at full full swing you know 65 to 69 type type of, of uh, similarities in terms of just the to just nonstop fucking work getting put in. Um, and, you know, you were at that, you know, right place, right time, um, you know, in terms of your career and where you were at and, and whatever. And uh, I, I know some of it you can't talk about, um, but some of it you can. And, and so I'd love to get into, um, you know, if you could kind of chronologically outline just your, your time at, at Team 3, what it was like checking in and, and kind of the feelings. Because I know, like, for me, when I checked into Team 3, it was pre-9-11. It was very different. Yeah. So I'm curious to get your take as, you know, now that we'd, we'd been, you know, in full-blown fucking war in Afghanistan and Iraq for a period of time. What, what was that like checking in? It was awesome. You know, uh, like I told you, you know, SQT was great for me. We had um, solid instructors, except for that one that got... <laughs> Got fired. Yeah, oh yeah, I remember him. <laughs> Talk about that yeah. another, another time. Not on this podcast. Yeah. So. We'll just say fishnet tops. Right? Oh, yeah, God. we're talking about the same guy, right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, uh, anyway, <laughs> get sidetracked. Yep. Anyway, um, I don't know. I was always drawn to, to Team Three. Yeah. Like, I don't know what it was. I don't know if I had talked to, like you and other instructors that I thought were were legit guys that I looked up to that just something about three i wanted to go there mm. and i didn't know where i was going until i was in um it was after sqt when i was in cold weather training up in kodiak alaska like everyone else knew where they were going and seth and i were still trying to figure out where we we're going and you know and then all of a sudden find out we're going to team three and i, I was fired up and i yeah. found out we're, we're going to delta platoon together i was like yeah. fucking a. awesome yeah and uh i remember you know seth going hey always have a notebook and a pen with you. Mechanical pencils are better because, you know, it, you know, a pen might fail, but a mechanical pencil, you can at least have it. And, you know, and I'm like, okay, roger that, sir. You know, and I remember, so we're graduating from um, SQT, and there's a couple other guys that went to Team 3 as well. One of them is actually, it's crazy for me to think about. We went through Buds and SQT together, and now he's a command master chief. Yeah, oh, it's fucking I'm wild. Like, yeah, <laughs> like, what really the fuck? happy I got out. No, I love what I do. <laughs> you know what I mean? But I think about that. I mean, I would be a couple of years away from a, a full blown retirement. Mm -hmm. You know, I'd be a senior chief or master chief by now for yeah. sure. Maybe. Uh, yeah. Maybe. <laughs> maybe an E five. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah. Maybe you're right. <laughs> uh, which you know, I'd be fine with. Yeah. Uh, Fucking sled dog yeah. for life. Oh, that's the best. Yeah. You know, but then also you look at what you can do in being a, in a position of leadership. Yeah. That's phenomenal as well. And yeah. so anyway, so I, I check in still team three and um, going around and meet my platoon chief. Our platoon chief actually came over and, and then brought us over and we're walking around the team. And I'm just like meeting guys and, you know, taking notes of the little stuff. And um, and I, I've always been there like, hey, let's be friends. Like <laughs> I was never like the I never had that tough guy like, yeah. Um, I'm a hard ass, like, let's just size each other up thing. I was just yeah. like, hey, like, hey, how you doing? My name is JP, you know, like, 
you know, we're working together. We're going to be friends. Like, you know what I mean? <laughs> you want to do karate yeah, in the garage yeah, or what? exactly. Like I thought, you know, which it's funny. Like, well, so I'm that young new guy checking into the SEAL team like that. And you know how the old guys are towards the yeah. new guys. And I quickly learned to yeah. keep my mouth yeah. shut. <laughs> yeah. And just, They don't want to be your friend right away. Yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? And, and rightfully so. Like, yeah. hey, you know, why is this guy even here? Like, well. Yeah. You know, he doesn't deserve a seat at the table. He's got to earn that seat. Yeah. And that's, I love that mentality. Yeah. And Seth kind of talked to me about it. He's like, hey, JP, man. He's like, we're, we're in the SEAL teams now. Like, you got to, I know you're friendly, go happy, go lucky guy. You're always talkative. You need to shut up. Like, <laughs> Same just, Mr. Rogers name. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You just need to you know, absorb it, take notes, be humble. Yeah. You know, and he's like, we're going to do this together. And I mean, when I think about stuff like that, it's, I just, you know, Seth was such a good person you know and uh so i check in the team and you know we find out all of our stuff and they're like hey uh you're leaving in a couple of days to head out to the desert to go in, to an off-road hummer driving and racing school you got to be back here sunday at this time uh you're gonna go go over to supply get all your gear everything else like that and i was like that's, that's you've got to be kidding yeah, that's me. one of those schools you're like am i on a hidden camera show right now yeah. like you're gonna fucking pay me to go off-road shit like, yeah. yeah off-road hummer driving and racing and navigation school yeah check so go out to the desert <laughs> yeah. do that that's where i became really close friends with Derek benson mm -hmm. we found out we're you know uh he was a buzz class ahead of me he's in class 241 with leif and then you know uh they hold the officers back <laughs> they do the officer training and then that's when leif and seth came into my my sqt class so i knew Derek really well uh we became like best friends out there and uh from that point on we we're just always hanging out like just started you know both rode street bikes started racing bikes you know just always always together yeah. um and so we go we do that work up we're getting ready to head overseas to do the you know the capture kill mission that you guys had done and other guys were doing over there and i mean it's such a badass mission yeah. it, it, that is it's the like that up. is the navy seal yeah. mission cool i'm gonna go sneak in at <clears throat> night while night vision i'm gonna blow open the front door or i'm gonna pick the lock we're gonna go get the guy out of his bed we're gonna catch him by surprise we're gonna kill the guys that try to fight back that have weapons awesome so that's what we're doing our whole workup for. That's what we're planning, blah, 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 blah. And then for like five weeks before we deploy, we find out that we're taking over the, the personal security detail mission. And we're like, <laughs> you're welcome. <laughs> You've got to be kidding me. <laughs> and so we go to like a week and a half, maybe two week uh, school of tops with the secret service yeah. to basically like, hey, here's your diamond. Here's formation. your base. Yeah. Here's your basics. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, and it was really cool working with those guys. And you know, I hadn't, I hadn't deployed yet. I was a new guy. I was only 19 or 20 at this time, but to show the level of intensity of training in third phase SQT, and then doing a workup, you know, we were doing scenarios against these guys. And these guys have been doing that for 10, 15, 20 years, right. With the secret service. Yeah. And they were like, we've never worked with a group that can shoot and move like you guys. Oh, like, shit. we would crush them in scenarios. God, that's crush awesome. Crush them. Like, absolutely soul crush them. Yeah. And obviously, I'm not talking down on Secret Service. It's just different levels of training, yeah. right? And those guys were like, if the, we can ever help you guys, you know what I mean? And it was really cool because of us getting to work with those guys. And then them, and for me, for what I took from that was like, wow we are just at a different level when it comes to our training, the amount of time that we put in. And so that kind of made me think more of like, just being like, Hey, you know, what we, what we get to do is, is amazing. Not everyone gets this level of training. Yeah. And so went over on that deployment, we're doing the personal security detail for the top seven dignitaries in Iraq during the election time frame. Oh, it sucks. You go, you think from, you're going to be on the offense to now you're on the defense. Yeah. yeah. I dude, I was young, I was immature and I had a really shitty attitude, you know. Um I was not happy to be there. Um and it it, it showed. You know, I remember one of the old guys, uh, his nickname is Pepper. Um he had to tune me up. Yeah. He had a little conversation yeah, I don't, with I don't me. Remember Pepper. He he's a good dude. Yeah. And um yeah, you know, I remember he 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 talked to me. He's like, "Hey, you know, I did my first workup and we we're getting ready to deploy and I had to have surgery." And I'm, I, I missed out on the initial push in Afghanistan. Like, how do you think that made me feel? He's like, look around at what we're getting to do. We're in civilian clothes. We're in low-vis body armor. We're in heated and air-conditioned, fully armored SUVs. You know, we're traveling all over Iraq 
to keep this guy safe. And he's a good guy. He's yeah. a good, you know, good Assyrian Christian. And, you know, he's he wants change and he's trying to make things, you know, happen over here. And you have a shitty attitude yeah. because you're not getting to go and do DAs right now. Grow up. Yeah. And I was just like, I remember we, we were sitting in the in a, one of our vehicles outside the tent and he pulled me in there and I was sitting in the driver's seat and he sat in the passenger seat and I thought he was going to beat my ass inside there, you know, and he, <laughs> and he should have, you yeah. know, and because I, I was in the wrong a hundred percent. And I just remember that conversation. I was like, check. Yeah. Okay. You know, and that kind of set me straight. Uh, and then we went through the rest of that. Um, I, I think he, he also wrote something up like on paper and he's just like, Hey, I'm gonna hold on to this. Yeah. If your attitude continues to be the same, it's going to be official. If not, I'll put it over in that burn pit over there, you know, yeah. before we leave. And it was, and that was the good little tune up I needed. You know, yeah. you, I needed that good old guy to just be hard on me and just say, Hey man, life could be worse. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know? And, and so I've always known that my parents always instilled that into me and I was just being a little prick. Right. Yeah. And so, um, but from that point on, it really changed my mindset in, into regards to like, I get to do this, you're right. You know, on deployment, I get to do this. And I had that mindset going through buds. I knew I was lucky to be there, but I had kind of lost sight of that. And it just took just somebody reminding me of that. Yeah. And then, so we do that deployment. We feel good about it. Everything's good. We keep those guys safe. Nothing major happens to those guys on, on that deployment. And then we we hear that things are starting to get kind of wild out west, you know, in, in Ramadi. And we're like, huh, what? You know, this insurgency term starting to be thrown out there. And we hear that it's it's legit out there. And so we come back getting ready to do another workup. Jocko comes in as our task unit commander. Now, I had heard about Jocko. I knew his reputation, and, um, you know, he, he held the line. There's no slack, no slack when it came to him, and that, I was fired up about that. And, um, you know, we had an awesome workout, and Jocko gave us that mindset of extreme ownership, and he he held the line, and he held the standards hard. Um, and so, and he took care of us and he showed us what leadership was all about, you yeah. know, leadership capital and building that up with your guys and, you know, when, when to use it, when to expend it and when to, when to save it. And yeah. so I uh, just, you know, learned a, a lot from Jocko and Leif and Seth. And then um, we, we deployed to Ramadi and it, it was amazing. It was, that was the, that, that was, was the wet the, dream deployment. Yes. That yeah. was the most amazing deployment ever. I mean, yeah. we were in gunfights almost every single day, yeah. you know, and um, being able to work with those soldiers and Marines that we worked with was insane. Yeah. I mean, those guys are, are hardened combat warriors. You know, we showed up to Ramadi and the 228 or they're a national guard unit out of Pennsylvania. You know, if anybody knows anything about the national guard, I mean, they're not trained properly. They don't have the right gear. They don't have, they don't have anything. That's good. not their gig. Yeah. You know, that's not their gig. Yeah. Absolutely. And, um, they got pulled over to Ramadi. And when we showed up, they had been in combat every single day for 14 months. God damn. F 14 months straight of fighting in the worst area in the world. But they in had Ramadi, to have taken some serious fucking heavies, huh? No, they did. They yeah. did. Um, uh, 94 were killed in God action. Damn. Over 300 were wounded when we showed up, and they yeah. controlled less than a third of the city. Do you know ballpark what size unit that was? Uh, that those numbers came out of dude i really should i i can't even think yeah, right it was now significant though. yeah yeah it was significant yeah. for sure i mean 94 um, i mean one significant yeah but. one significant but 94 i mean yeah. that's ridiculous you yeah. know and over 300 wounded oh, um and then and they could only control less than a third of the city that's yeah. how bad it was there yeah. um there was estimated between four thousand to five thousand enemy fighters in that region at that time yeah and i remember we were replacing a, a different task unit and that task unit leadership told jocko and leif and seth like hey if you guys go into this area you're going to get almost all your guys killed like you're going to get your guys wounded you're going to get your guys killed nobody's going to be able to go in there and get you guys don't go there it's stupid right and so what do we do where that's where we're gonna go and no but that in the, it's a, you know, obviously that's jock dope. they didn't want anybody to get wounded or killed yeah. but you know this I, I tell this companies all the time what do you accomplish from the sidelines yeah zero nothing yeah like get in the fight figure out if it's even worth fighting 
Yeah. for and if it is worth fighting for you then get in the fight yeah. and realize that there's going to be some sacrifice it's going to be hard work but get to work yeah. and that's what we did and you know what we were honored to serve the 228 to yeah. support them in any way possible it didn't matter and I, I still have emails in one of my old accounts from other team guys going what in the hell are you guys doing yeah. this isn't what team guys do yeah. we don't do daytime urban presence patrols well guess what they needed us. They were asking for additional gunfire. When they found out SEALs were in the area, they said, well, this is what we're doing. Can you guys help? Can you support in any way possible? And yeah. we're like, yeah, cool. Yeah. And then... Talk about well, it. yeah, I mean, to me, like, I, I would I would disagree with those guys. I mean, to me, that's exactly what SEALs do, I, you know? Like, uh, yes. We do what the fuck needs to be done. We get the job done. Yeah. It like, doesn't matter. That was one of the neatest things about, you know, the time I was there, which was, was earlier... But some of the things that we did were so far outside the fucking scope of what I ever thought we would be doing. But it was like, yeah, it, it was, hey, can you go check this fucking bridge and route out that we're going to be bringing the entire 1st Marine Division through tomorrow morning? Fuck yeah, let's do it. Yeah. I don't yeah. know how we're going to do it, yeah, but we're going to do it. Yeah, I mean, like at that time, there were there were lines, you know, yes. there, there were, you know, enemy lines and, and advances in terms of where <laughs> our, our military had gone and yep. hadn't gone. And we were going past that mm -hmm. with four, you know, unarmored fucking shit shit bird humvees you know two of which didn't even have doors on them yeah. uh, you know by ourselves like i mean they, like they didn't even they're like what in the fuck like because they, they weren't expecting four humvees to be driving around yeah. like they're just like what the fuck like you know we were getting looked at like this like in bewilderment you know yeah. but but anyway my point is is that doing stuff like that i agree like to me that that's what from my perspective and and i i love that, that we share that um you know that that principled approach to to being a team guy is that you you do what's asked of you to the best of your ability and mm -hmm. you figure out a way to get it done yeah you know? no excuses yeah you know and that's I, you know one of the shirts i i, I almost wore i wish i would have is just because it ties into what we just said you know it's one of the shirts from echelon front and, um um you know lave talks about it just being default aggressive yeah like that is our mode yeah we don't know anything else other than that yeah and that's not like going out and getting a bar fight or towards somebody. It's just getting stuff done, making it happen, yeah. you know, taking the fight to your enemy, whatever your enemy is. Yeah. We all have enemies. We all are dealing with different enemies. Yeah. Take the fight to your enemy. Yeah. Quit being complacent. You know, if you looked at how we patrolled in the streets, our chests were out, our head was up and we were scanning for threats. Yeah. We weren't like hunkered ever. We were never like that. Yeah. We were ready to get in a fight. We, we hunted them. Yeah, we started hunting the enemy. We took the fight to them, and that's that's what made the difference in Ramadi. And yeah. then, you know, a, m a month later, the one one AD replaced the two two eight, and the AD stands for Armored Division. Yeah, Armored is tanks. Yeah, dude, the, rock and roll, sexy, sexy <laughs> creations right there. Those are, the invention of the tank is, in my mind, the the greatest invention that we've ever had. Yeah, because I can tell you, I've been in buildings pinned down by suppressive enemy fire while we were running low on ammo mm -hmm. because we've been in a gunfight for. A, hours right back and forth back and forth trying to keep the high ground trying to protect soldiers on the streets trying to protect our seals on the streets patrolling with marines and and soldiers and iraqi soldiers and a combat outpost trying to be built and we and we're like hey we're running out of ammo we need tank support and we get on the radio and we call them for tank support and those guys would be like roger that we're headed your way that's a really good feeling oh fuck yeah and then when those tanks get in front of your building and you just hear that <laughs> like if that turret moving yeah. and you're like hey you know you, you know leif talks about it in both the books that yeah. leif and jocko wrote extreme ownership and the dichotomy of leadership about you know firing into a building's window where the enemy fires are with a full magazine of tracer rounds so that they they know where it's coming from yeah. and then that tank just turns that way and it's like bah, 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 bah. Yeah. and yeah, they just start quiet. oh guess what <laughs> Those enemy fighters will never, ever be an issue again. Yeah. You know, And those guys came to our aid every single time we asked them to, yeah. if they were not already helping somebody else, yeah. every single time. Yeah. And that was amazing because in Ramadi, it wasn't, it was, there were, there were silos obviously at the beginning, right? Army, Marine Corps, Navy. But Ramadi was all about one team, one fight. Yeah. It didn't matter who got the credit. It didn't matter as long as we we won yeah. because they told us Ramadi was an unwinnable war. Yeah. You know, a, a quote from the Marine Corps was from an intelligence officer was actually leaked to the press. And it, it said the social and political situation has deteriorated to a point that U.S. and Iraqi troops are no longer capable of militarily defeating the insurgency in Al-Anbar. Yeah. That sounds like a challenge. 
Yeah, and we're like, <laughs> check, okay. You yeah. know, and that it was just to see that and to see the what these soldiers did. Hmm. I mean, those guys are over there for 15 months at a time. No, to see nuts. what the Marines were doing, yeah. the living conditions they had. That's World War II shit. Yeah. yeah, it was. You know, and I was fortunate enough to be able to go out to that small forward operating base on the eastern side of Ramadi. It was myself, six other SEALs, and an interpreter. And we were working with the first 506 Infantry Division, the famous Band of Brothers. Yeah. That's who I got to work yeah, with. First of the Dude, I mean, it, just to be able to work yeah. with those guys was phenomenal. Yeah. But that fob that we lived on, uh, full metal jacket was a building that I lived in. It was Camp Corregidor. That building was an old blown out building for, that was part of a university. And mm -hmm. that the the building was built up with sandbags and plywood and we had dirt floors and we built up little rooms in there. I mean, it was hard living conditions, but that's what I wanted. Like, yeah. that's what we all wanted. We're like, yeah. yes, because if it's shitty here, that means that we're in it. Yeah. That's we're, we're going to be in the fight. I'm not yeah. on some big built up base where I can go get Domino's or Subway or, or Starbucks. It's Rocky Four style. Yes. Yeah. That's. That is the best correlation yeah. anybody's ever given. It yeah. was Rocky Four style. Yeah. You know, there. You know, a lot of times our 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 chow hall got hit by mortars, and so we we're eating MREs. Our, our, the shower tents. You know, I talked about on Jocko's podcast. The shower tents got hit by mortars. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's like cool. Well, how do you shower? You take your water bottle, you poke holes in the top of it. Your buddy stands on a chair and squeezes it over <laughs> you, and that's how you know you kind of wash up or you baby wipe up. And that it was, you know, there's just. And like, he gets your back while he's at yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so it was just, you know, it was hard living, but it was awesome. And I, I miss those days, you know, of sleeping on an air mattress that was on a uh, a bed that you made out of two by fours and plywood, and yeah. the door is a poncho liner. And you know, Mikey was right next to me. Another guy, uh, the Badger, uh, he's still in. Yeah. Uh, it was was right next to me, and he was he, he taught me a lot about being a sniper in the SEAL teams as well phenomenal individual i saw him at seth's funeral and i was like bro it was so good to see him but i was just like looking at his dress uniform literally his trident it was like on a scapula <laughs> it is yeah. on the top of his trap yeah that his rack is just yeah. insane no i know it. you know and so it's funny when people are always like oh thank you you did three combat deployments i'm like i'm a quitter i got out early like i have buddies on their 10th 11th 12th combat deployment oh, no. guys are still in the fight you know i didn't i didn't really do much you know but ramadi was legit yeah. and we got to do a lot of good stuff um the cost of ramadi was heavy though man i mean we lost mark lee the first navy seal killed yeah. in iraq you know uh, I, I was talking to him the week before he was killed yeah. um you know he's wanting to he was going to buy a house for his wife and surprise her and you know then start a family and um the same day mark was killed ryan job was shot in the face gravely wounded i mean no completely blind is in germany coming back to the united states his high school sweetheart quits nursing school so she can take care of him you know he summits mount rainier he's completely blind no sense of smell no sense of taste um but living life to the fullest gets a business degree with a 4.0 and then the week that him and his wife found out they're having a baby girl, he goes in for his 22nd surgery and dies, you know? Yeah, I, I mean, that whole story is fucking just heartbreaking. I, do you know what, what happened with it? Was it just complications? Just complications, yeah. man. And then, yeah, it's, you know, the, the hard one is, you know, I just, you know, if you ever, you know, like, guys will see me, like, from stage talking or on podcasts, I'll, like, you see that scar there. Like, I cut my finger down to the bone, um, and they thought I was going to lose my finger, and so I got flown out of... Uh, Ramadi to a, a another base to have surgery because they thought like and um, you know the only mission I missed out on was that last one when Mikey was killed yeah and um, you know Mikey Mansoor he he was like one of my new guys you know he was he was my security gunner when I was a point man and or acting as a sniper he was always by my side always and I wasn't there for him you know I wasn't there on that mission and that. It, you know, there's a lot of guilt from that. And, you know, for a while, there's a lot of darkness and there's a lot of questions and doubt, anger, all that stuff. But, I mean, you can't sit there and focus on all that. No, no. You, you can't. Because where does that get you? Nowhere. It gets you nowhere. And, and, yeah. and those feelings that I had are no different than the feelings that anybody else that's listening to this podcast has felt. We've all felt all those things in your life. Mm -hmm. And you have to look at all the good that you've done and the good that you can do. You can't sit there and you know focus on all the, all the bad stuff in your past. It yeah. gets you nowhere. 
What are you going to do with this? What are you going to do with the gift that you have? And there's been a couple different scenarios in, throughout my career that I was very fortunate enough where I was still able to, to be alive, you yeah. know, and you, you have to... You have to take those lessons that you learned and, and pass on. I mean, Battle Ramadi was ridiculous. I mean, you know, nine Abram battle tanks were completely destroyed. You know, the big, the big huge Abram battle tanks, nine of those were gone. 15 Bradley fighting vehicles, 34 Humvees, yeah. 98 guys were killed in action. And over 500 were wounded. And what, and what uh, time span was that? So 61 were killed in action during our six months with them. Yeah. And then during their whole whole time over there, 15 months, 98 total were killed in action. Yeah. Fucking Christ. That that whole operation and that the you know, the Sunni triangle during that time was uh I remember, you know, I, I was back as an instructor, um, and Mon Mikey Mansoor was actually the first uh student that I had had yeah. that had died in training. And for me, like I I'll never forget going to his funeral like to to this day i mean i've had because i didn't really know him i mean yeah. I, I i vaguely remembered him yeah. from from being a, one of his instructors but um you know i i had guys you know glenn and ty were two of my closest friends Dude, ty was such know, an amazing guy yeah um you know but of all of the funerals that i've been to that to this day and, and i i have no doubt for the rest of my fucking life was was the toughest yeah, you know, uh, because of the circumstances, and, and it was the fr like it almost felt like. By no means is this me saying I was a father figure in his life because I, I I wasn't, but but having been one of his instructors and and that being the first student that that you know had yeah. had been lost in combat since I was an instructor, just something about that hit me so fucking hard. You know, like even the Temple of the Dog song, uh, "Say Hello to Heaven," was played mm -hmm. to this day. I mean, it's been. 13 fucking years, 12, 13 yeah. years uh, to this day. I can't listen to that fucking song. Yeah. You know, like the second it comes on, I change the fucking channel. Well, you know? I mean, but you, you say you like you weren't, but you were, you were a father figure because that's what we did in the teams when we were instructors. And it didn't matter if those guys were younger than us, our, our age or older. You know, I was at trade after Ramadi, you know, uh, I got pulled from SEAL team three cause I had to have surgery and I, I couldn't, I had some issues with that surgery and so I couldn't stay at SEAL Team 3, which is was heartbreaking to me because I was supposed to be, you know, back in, you know, we're supposed to be going to Solder City. And Mike Sorelli, who was on the rooftop with Mikey, was the OIC of that platoon that I got pulled from. Yeah. Like it just killed me. Killed me yeah. to 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 be pulled from that. You know, and I, I go to Buds and I'm at Buds for a couple of months and I get Jocko pulls me over to trade at. And so I mean you know, one of the Bud's class I was a Bud's instructor for was class 265. 265 has the most amount of guys that have been killed from one single Bud's class. Oh, shit. I think there's like six guys, six guys from that class have been yeah, killed. Yeah. And I knew those guys. Those guys were legit yeah. warriors, right? And then they come through training, and I'm at Trade It as one of the uh, for for a little for a year, I was the LPO, the leading petty officer, in charge of all of our urban warfare training. You know, so all the SALC training that we did, I ran all that stuff. And so I remember all these guys coming through training, and then I was also a CQC instructor in addition to doing the SALC training. And so you just get to know all these guys, and then you find out that they get killed, and it's just, yeah. And I was younger than a lot of these guys, and I, I still felt like what you just described because yeah. it's like, did I not? Did I not teach them? Is there something I didn't do? You know, and it, but it's also the camaraderie and the brotherhood that we have because you know, at any point, you know, if you're a good team guy, if you would have done exactly what they did, yeah, if you would have been in those positions and actually deploying to combat, you know, and not avoiding it. Yeah, yeah, no shit. To me, there, there's just a there's an inherent sense of responsibility that you feel for it, you know, and, and mm -hmm. you can't, you can't help but feel that. But. It's hard to explain. Yeah. I've tried to explain it to guys that, yeah. and I just, yeah, you it's really just can't, one of those things you know. I, I chalk up and I just tell people, Hey, you know, there's a few things in life that you just can't explain. Yeah. And this is one of those yeah. things. That and women. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, um, well, so, so going back to, uh, you, you mentioned the introduction of the tanks. Um, I, I would like to talk about that for a second. Would you say that, that was a game changer in terms of your guys' presence there, like totally yes. flipped the script? Absolutely. Is that when you were mentioning the uh, 
the slow spinning of the turret like it reminds me of uh when you're going up on a fucking roller coaster yeah like it's that anticipation you know <laughs> yeah you know like that super yep. slow and it's, it's super you know the anticipation is 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 the hardest part of it or the or the worst or the the most exciting depending upon which end you're on but <laughs> yeah uh, you know but um can you describe kind of the you know the once the implementation of that did you notice like kind of a paradigm shift in terms of I can only assume that now the enemy's tactics had to have been, uh, you know, adapted to that. And, and, and what, what was that like once they showed yeah, up? Yeah, I mean, those guys we were fighting were smart. You know, people are like, oh, dumb, you know. I was like, no. No, they're fucking smart. They're very smart. They're still alive. They're still in the game. You know, like, I, I didn't grow up hunting, but I always ask when I talk to companies, I say, hey, any hunters in the room? The guys would be like, raise their hands. Like, hell yeah, you know, like guys are getting all excited. I'm like, hey, does a buck get big by being dumb? Yeah. Every single time. Guys just start shaking their head. They're like, hell no. And I'm like, these guys were still alive because they were smart. Yeah. They knew what they were doing. They were evil, evil people. And they were, they had no rules. Yeah. We had rules that we had to adhere to. They had no rules. Mm -hmm. And so they they had to adapt to that, you know. And I I will say, like, the soldiers and marines that we worked with, they were default aggressive also. So yeah. you have you have you have soldiers, marines, and SEALs that are being told like, hey, this is unwinnable. You can't win. And the leadership from all those units are like, no, we're going to win. And this is how we're going to win. And then that attitude is reflected in down to their own guys. It's contagious. And guys start to believe that they can win. Mm -hmm. We believed in it. We believed that we were going to win in the Battle of Ramadi. The soldiers that we worked with, they believed in it. The Marines that we worked with, everybody freaking believed in it. And we could, we just got to work, you know. And those those tanks were an absolute game changer. It's a tank. Yeah. I mean, you know, they drive through buildings. You know, there's times where we were pinned down in a building and we couldn't get out. We couldn't even leave the courtyard. Like we might be able to be in the courtyard, and we couldn't even leave the gate from the courtyard to go out in the streets because guys were getting shot, and you know, you just couldn't do that. And so we'd tell those tanks, and they would back through. They would drive through that fence. They would back the tank up to the front door of the building, and we literally would run from the house into the tank. They'd load up, and we'd just take off, and it's like, absolute game changer. Yeah, yeah. You know, absolute. But, you know, hey, then again, those are big targets as well. Yeah. And the IED threats mm -hmm. out there were, were no joke. We didn't call the tanks in unless we knew we absolutely had to have them. Otherwise, a, a, a good portion of our guys were going to get killed. Yeah. Like, we didn't do it because we also knew – them coming in, the the threat of them hitting IEDs and getting guys wounded or killed was high as well. So that's some of those things that we had. Sometimes we just had to wait until <clears throat> night, right? And yeah. just be like, hey, we're going to have to get out of here once the nightfall comes, and that's going to help yeah. give us the advantage. And, I mean, that's kind of around the time where they started adopting the, the EFP-type mm -hmm. shape charges and shit yeah. to, to get through some of the new super armored vehicles in the in the fucking tanks and shit yeah. right i mean so yeah that's a that's a dice dicey fucking scenario no doubt um one of the things you mentioned earlier about uh that, that kind of struck a chord with me in terms of body language the way that you guys patrolled versus how everybody else you know had, had patrolled previously some of the national guard guys i'm curious you know because body language is such a, a huge component to dog training um was was there any any element of of your uh, interpretation of understanding in terms of of the enemy responding different or realizing like these fucking guys are different the the, the way that they're patrolling the way that they're carrying themselves that type of stuff can mm -hmm. you can you speak to the the difference that that made or? so I, I don't i don't want to be coming off like i'm saying anything official <laughs> uh but i do i do remember you know when we would work uh with the iraqi soldiers and they would they were starting to build relationships with the local populace that were good, innocent people that just want to live a normal life, right? Yeah. And we started to hear that the enemy fighters, they like they knew who we were, mm -hmm. like because we had different gear, we had different helmets, and like they knew when, when the guys with tan helmets came in, all hell's breaking. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Because we were hunting them. Yeah. We weren't on the defense, even when we were set up doing overwatches for those combat outposts to be built or for guys to patrol through the streets, we were always on the deep, on the offense. Yeah. We were, we were scanning, we were hunting them. We were bringing the fight to them. Yeah. And that changed like that. I mean, the local populace knew that, like they knew when we were in, they're like, 
out of the streets, right? Yeah. Because if something was going to happen, they, they knew we, we, we brought the heat. Yeah. And uh, there was actually a book um, that, that they talk about that. You know, it's like, hey, the guys, you know, when we came in with the tan helmets, they knew what was about to go down. Yeah. And so the posture, um, that, that default aggressive posture, saved us i yeah. guarantee it saved our lives multiple times and mm -hmm. you know we weren't just patrolling to the streets like we were active like scanning windows scanning alleyways scanning door you know as you're you know going past stuff and so even if i don't see an enemy fighter and i knew they were out there they didn't know that i didn't know they were there they yeah. thought you know all of a sudden now my gun goes from here to boom up into a window like we'd do that instead of just like walking looking yeah. you know you know present your weapon different ways and whatnot and that we were actually attacked less than other units yeah. um, and we were out there more than anybody else. It's like uh, going from sitting ducks, you know, waddling through the street to fucking goddamn jaguars, right? Yes. Like fucking re just ready to, uh, to pounce on shit. That's fucking awesome. Um, you mentioned Overwatch. I know uh, one of the neat components of, of your career and story is that uh, you were essentially Chris Kyle's opposite. Yes. Uh, can you talk about two, two things as it relates to that? Is number one is the, for those of you that have, have read American Sniper or seen the movie, kind of if, if you can talk uh, a little bit to that in terms of what your relationship was uh, character-wise in, in, in the movie and book, but then also on a broader scale. Uh, what that was like uh, at that time because you know again like I was back as as an instructor at that point and uh, I remember hearing because um, you know he and I were in Iraq on our it was mm -hmm. his first deployment my second and uh, you know I remember him from that I'm curious to get your take of what what was that like from the driver's seat of being in that you know prime capacity as an overwatch sniper opposite him and, and that whole that whole fucking deal um it was humbling it was legit you know chris was was a great sniper we had a lot of great snipers on our task unit i mean tony euphrati was a platoon chief for charlie platoon and he was a sniper as well right and yeah. they knew how important snipers were and it was so unique because we came back from our first deployment we have a condensed workup you know meaning that we weren't going to have the normal 18 month workup we had to do a full workup and all the post-deployment, pre-deployment leave, all that stuff in 11 and a half months before yeah. we pushed back out to Ramadi. And they're like, hey, we need this many snipers. And I got picked, you know, as one of the guys to get to go sniper. I wanted to go, you know, that's all I talked about to the other snipers. You know, the, yeah, I was always like trying to, you know, that's what I wanted to do. And we went through a, a short condensed uh school it was the nsw short sniper course and so we go through that sniper school which is funny because we didn't do the stocking portion and something else they never gave <laughs> us official sniper certificates oh, sure. yeah so <laughs> officially i'm, I'm not, not a actually a sniper yeah. however i have more confirmed ki sniper kills than all those instructors put yeah. together but <laughs> whatever right. and so shove, um, shove that on a yeah well, up your ass. Oh, one of the instructors when we came home uh, he, he was just like he was pissed like he yeah. legitimately like was pissed. He's like, yeah. dude, that's such bullshit. And I'm like, yeah, I, I don't know what to say. Sorry. Yeah, like what, what you helped teach me saved. Fucking yeah. That's why I was like, actually what, you know, what you taught me, but he was just so bitter yeah. that he didn't, you know, I was like, jealous. yeah, okay, cool. Whatever, bro. But, uh, you know, so anyways, we got through sniper school and they realized how important that training is. And so we, we would do any type of long range training that we could, like anytime it came up, right? Yeah. And then we find out we're going to Ramadi, it's gonna be an urban environment. And so we started trying to implement that into training, learning about that. Yeah, I went to Home Depot and built out our urban sniper kits. Like we Shout didn't have Home that. Depot. Yeah, you know, we didn't have that <laughs> at the time. There was no urban sniper kits yeah. that were issued to us. We were yeah. like, uh, we need all this, 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 this. Myself and another sniper went and we like, so we built and designed the urban sniper kits for our task unit. And you know, they're like, okay, cool, go go make up like six of those. So then we went back with the government credit card and <laughs> aisle know, 13, yeah, the sniper hide. Yeah, aisle. exactly. <laughs> yeah. You know, got all that stuff and you know, that was cool to be able to be a part of that and, you know, getting Chris's input on some of that. Cause of obviously what he did in, in Fallujah and um, which was cool. Cause Chris was like, yeah, cool. Run with it. And he like, he totally could have taken the lead on that. Right. Yeah. Like Chris is the legend in the teams when it came to, you know, from what he did in Fallujah. And then, uh, and then we go to Ramadi and, and Ramadi just hearing about what he was doing and you know I was we were never in a competition it wasn't you know it was cool like I didn't care who killed who like who yes you're killing bad evil people like 
As long if, as they're getting fucking smoked. It's not, it doesn't matter, you yeah. know? And we had uh, really good snipers in our platoon. Like I said, the one guy uh, calling the Badger, and he's still in, and he, he was amazing, you know? And the only reason why I was the lead sniper was because this guy was put in a position of leadership. He took over as our LPO because our LPO got pulled out to go do something else, and then he was also our acting chief for a, couple, for a good portion of the time. Mm-hmm. And so... You know, I was just put in that position where I was the lead sniper, right? And, you know, and I was just, I just was on the gun at more because I was in that position. And and so if you've read Chris's book or watched the movie, you know, when they tease him about the young sniper catching up to him, that was me when I was 23 years old. Yeah, that's and I turned 23 shit. right before we deployed. Oh, shit. And it's crazy. You know, I was our point man, lead sniper, machine gunner. Yeah. And I was only 23 years old just turned 23 yeah no i mean that's the same, I, same thing like i was i was a fucking kid you know and, and i look back on it now as somebody in my 40s and i think damn you're old just, you ain't got to tell <laughs> me <kid. laughs> uh, you're not telling me anything i don't fucking know i know that every time every morning i wake up i'm like oh my fucking god i'm old um but you know it, it's funny because i always remember growing up in the seal teams i was always the kid the baby the fucking young buck that you know whatever and now i'm like like where where what happened? Like the blink of an eye, and now I'm a forty year old guy, and I look at, at these kids that are in their early twenties, and I'm just like, holy shit! Like I can't believe I did that when I was that age. Like I don't know if I was just fucking stupid, you know, or, or naive, or both, you know, patriotic. Like I mean, a, a question I was asked just yesterday actually is, you know, why did you join the Navy? I was like, patriotism and naivety, yeah. <laughs> you know, like. But well, I think you're also you're not addressing the fact that, you know, that is what you were designed to do, Mike. Yeah. You can't argue that. You know what I mean? You can't. And now we obviously have turds in the SEAL teams. There's turds in every unit, every organization. There's guys that slip through the cracks. We know a couple of those, you yeah. know. But we were designed to do that. That is that is the plan that God had for us at that point in time. Yeah. That was a chapter in our life, right? Now, it was an awesome chapter. Yeah. And our current chapters right now are pretty badass also like with what you've been doing what i get to do with echelon front you know the the i i get to speak to people which i actually don't like because i grew up with a speech <laughs> yeah. impediment oh shit i was in speech therapy all throughout school i hate talking in front of people it, yeah. i don't like it but it's my new mission yeah. and i believe in what we do with echelon front so i turn it off and i i just tell myself it, it's it, it's game time right yeah. and so when i go up on stage i just i just flip that switch uh, but what I love, what I'm so passionate about, you know, because I had a guy who was like, hey, man, you know, when when the, the love of the road gets old, let me know. I got something for you. Yeah. It's not that I love being on the road. I don't like being away from my wife and kids. I don't enjoy that. I don't like being away from my jiu-jitsu gym. Like, <clears throat> but I love what I do for the field training exercises that we do. Yeah. You know, and that's where we apply hands-on stress-induced training for companies that build and ingrain in our leadership principles yeah and so i love that like i that's not work to me i I love getting to do that and because that's a part of what i did in the teams and with what you're doing it's a part of what you did you know what i mean and that was passionate to you and that's the same thing and you god designed you to do that in your past and god designed you to do what you're doing right now and i feel the same way yeah and that's what you know guys you know they don't realize is we did what we were able to do because that's what we were meant to do yeah you look at these guys that have won one you know congressional medal of honor you listen to their stories and you're like what yeah but i know i know you at the back of your mind like when you hear those stories you're like i would love to be in that situation oh yeah i would love yeah. every medal of honor story I've, yeah. I've ever read i'm like I'm a little jealous. Yeah. I don't want the Medal of Honor. I don't care about that. I just want that situation. Yeah. I want to see yeah. what would happen. I want to yeah. see what I could do. It's the same thing. You're in a bank, right? And you're like, yeah. please be robbed right now. <laughs> I know. It. Please, somebody try it. to rob this yeah. bank while I'm in here. I see all these videos of like holdups at fucking convenience stores. I'm like, <laughs> I wish a motherfucker would just once. <laughs> like, just one fucking time. Yeah, why can't you do? Why can't you try yeah. to rob the lady right in front oh, of me? I know me? it. God damn it. Yeah. No, I hear so you. So that's, I mean, that's just the way I've always, I felt. And, you know, I don't, I know I don't live the greatest example as a Christian, but my faith is, has always been there and always will be there. And I, I, I try to be a better man every day for my kids and for my wife and for those that are listening to this podcast and are going to follow on social media and see what we do with echelon front and what you do with your company. I mean, that's why, 
I think if we strive to do that, it's also a way that we can honor the brotherhood, you Absolutely. know, honor our, our brothers that we had to take up the trident off our uniform and pound into that casket before they mm -hmm. went down in the ground. Yeah. And the amount of tridents that we've had to buy over the years is sickening. Oh, I know it. It's, you know, I have an event I'm going to this weekend. It's a black tie event. And they're like, Hey, you know, instead of renting a tux, like we'd love to have you in your dress blues. And I was like, Oh, that's cool. Yeah. That'd be awesome. And Shit, then, they don't fit anymore. Well, no, they, yeah, <laughs> yeah. They're a little tight, but they fit. Um, but I realized I don't have a trident because yeah. the last time I wore my dress blues was at Seth's funeral. Yeah. And the last time I had a trident on, it was when I took it off my chest and put it onto his casket. And I'm like, yeah. I, I don't have a trident. I can't wear my uniform, yeah. you know? And so, but thank, uh, thank goodness there's Amazon. Yeah. Or 7-Eleven at this point. Fuck, yeah, you can get them no, just about anywhere. No kidding. You know, it, you bringing that up, it, it certainly strikes memories for me of, of going to countless fucking funerals doing that same thing. I mean, that that tradition that's relatively new um, is something that uh, the, the power behind that is, is impossible to, to explain uh, and, and just even trying to encompass the, the emotions that, uh, that are so elicited from, from that experience. I won't even try to, to do it justice, but uh, I have never been a part of, of anything anywhere near as powerful as, as that, that procession of a, of a seal funeral when, when we take part in that. I mean, that, uh, that whole process and experience is... Uh, well, the, fun it, the funerals were always obviously hard for guys in our community. I mean, there's been funerals since yeah. you know, the UDT days in Vietnam, you know, yeah. but I think what made that so impactful is that... I might be wrong, but I'm pretty sure that started with Mark's funeral. Mm, yeah, I think uh, so. I'm pretty sure that was the first time guys yeah. were taking their tridents off. Yeah, and EOD guys were taking their EOD pins off and putting it in the casket as well. Which guys were like, "What the fuck is he's not trying?" I was like, "Oh, that made me so mad!" Like, yeah. no, those EOD guys are our brothers. You know what I mean? Yeah, they were yeah. out with us on every combat mission, doing workups with us, like. It, with guys that said that it, it showed me that they did nothing in the community yeah. there those were the guys that hit at training yeah. instead of deploying yeah. you know cool go go be a really good athlete mm -hmm. when guys are like in combat yeah. like get, give me a break man yeah. and and so seeing that at marks and then being a part of it for the first time at mikey's uh um, you know, shadow what you just said it was it's so hard to explain it's so yeah. emotional yeah. and the reason why i think mike and we can discuss this or you can tell me i'm wrong is um what's some of the what's one of the greatest or the ones most guys proudest moments getting the teams it? receiving your trident is receiving your trident yeah. when when a when another seal pins the trident yeah, onto your uniform there's nothing like that. No, I know. And then I don't know if they do it anymore, but I know we had pinning parties. Fucking hey, we did. I know you were at mine. <laughs> <laughs> you're a mean, mean guy. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, exactly. But when you have the pinning parties where guys are, you know, smashing that trident into your chest yeah. and guys are walking around with, you know, a pinning party is, you know, you get the your trident pounded into your chest without the back. It's not going on your uniform. Yeah. The, the trident's actually being stuck into your chest muscle. Yeah. And guys are like pounding that into you, and every team guy there gets to punch it, or they pull it out and put it back in there. Tony Euphrati was there as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, anyways, and the upper uh, deck at Danny's later doing the same goddamn thing. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so that was such a proud moment. Yeah. I still have my T-shirt. I still have the T-shirt that I was wearing at the beginning of the night when that trident was pinned into my chest, and oh, it shit. still has the blood on it. And then, you know, you eventually end up taking your shirt off and just walking around with a trident stuck yeah. into your chest because that meant so much to us because we knew of the guys that had paved the way for us to receive that. The, those, those paths were paved in blood. Yeah. And those SOPs that we learned in training were, were written in blood, just like the SOPs that we have changed and instilled into guys and the lessons that we teach guys still to this day from what we do with Echelon Front. They're not SOPs for combat. It's now lessons learned that you can apply to your personal and professional lives. And the reason why we're so passionate about it is because those lessons were written in blood. Yeah. And it's so that people can take those lessons, learn from it, and not make the same mistakes. And yeah, you're not in combat, but the principles of these decisions that we make in life are universal. Whether it's in combat, in the boardroom, in your marriage, in your relationship with your kids, it's, it's all very, it all goes back and forth. And so 
we understand how important that is. And so when you take that trident off your uniform, you ever see a team guy without a trident on his uniform? Yeah. Ever? No, I mean, on, only at those funerals. That's and, the only you know. time. And most guys have a backup, right? So that they can put on later that day uh, because you just feel <clears throat> naked without it. Yeah. And you know, and so just taking that off and putting it in a, in a casket for your, for your brother, I mean, there's there's nothing like it. Yeah, to me, I think the you know what it what it makes me think of is because it's such a uh, a proud moment and something that you know there's really no greater moment that, that kind of sticks out. But w- what it takes to earn that, you know, and how much blood, sweat, and tears, and, and emotion, and hard work, and dedication, and, and bullshit that you have enveloped into the the day that ultimately culminates in you being awarded that it's part of you yes it's you know that trident now is is symbolic to to what you've been through and your struggle and all this other shit and so by by removing that and pounding it into that casket and ultimately it going out down into the ground you know what i love about that ceremony is that is that in every one of those uh, caskets now there is a piece of us yes that, that is buried with that guy yeah. you know and, and a symbol of of all of that, you know, that, that, that gets dedicated to that and, and, uh, and ultimately put into the ground. And I think, you know, it's just, it's such an amazing fucking, you know, mm-hmm. part of, of, uh, of our community that I'm, um, I'll be forever proud. Um, I'd like to back up just real quick. One thing you mentioned was your faith. I am curious. I'm not a particularly religious guy, but I am curious, you know, in, in your deployment specifically as a sniper and some of the heavier gun, gun battles you've been into, um, was faith something that uh, that played a role in terms of uh, even just something as simple as you thought about as you're pulling the trigger, getting ready to whatever, or did it just never even really register? I mean, we. I mean, read the Old Testament, right? I mean, just look at. I mean, guy. I mean, there's been a lot of warriors, um, you know, in the Bible and throughout time, and evil exists, and evil needs to be eliminated. There's no question about it. And the evil that we were battling in Ramadi was unlike anything else. I mean, it was at a full-on spiritual warfare, <clears throat> satanic level of evil in Ramadi. I mean, it was absolutely disgusting. And not once did I ever hesitate or think twice, like, yeah. oh, I'm a Christian. I shouldn't be killing somebody else. You know, I'm, I'm at war, you yeah. know, and that's, that's what happens at war. And that's what happens when evil exists. I mean, these guys were raping and torturing and murdering innocent people that didn't conform to their ideology. You know, before we showed up to Ramadi, uh, I want to say it was eight or nine, maybe 10 of the tribal uh, elders in that region were tortured and murdered along with their families. And so guess what the rest of the tribal elders did? They fled. So there was no order. Yeah. I mean, they literally could do whatever they wanted. And the local populace was so terrified of what could happen to them. Like, they wouldn't even look at us sometimes. And it took us coming back over and over and over and actually building relationships with the local populace. And, oh, you need water? We're going to bring water back to you tomorrow. Yeah. And they're like, yeah, yeah, okay. And we bring water back the next day. And they're like, you know, like, oh, you need gas for your generator? We'll, we'll, we'll patrol through the streets with gas because that's – Makes sense, right? <laughs> yeah. But we told them we were going to do something, we'd do it for them. Or, hey, yeah. we'd have our guys come back with their toolbox and who were mechanically inclined, and they would help some guy get his vehicle started and fixed so that he could move his family out of the area. Cars loaded up, they want to leave, but guess what? The car doesn't run. So we're going to fix your car, we're going to fill it with gas and help you get out of that horrible city. Yeah. You saw the good, you know, and you see the innocence of the in those children, mm-hmm. you know. Um, not once did I ever have an issue. Yeah, you know the only issue I have is that I wasn't more aggressive over there. Yeah, I mean, I guess know? I'm curious. Did it, did it play a role in any way? Like, was it even something that registered, or was it you know was it something that you thought that kind of helped fuel the extermination of evil, or was it was it just kind of a non factor? Like, I, it was more of just a non factor. Yeah, I mean, I guess you could say you know it could could have fueled it because. Uh, but you know, but you, I mean, you say that and if someone's going to take it that I was like <laughs> fucking modern day crusader. Yeah. Yeah. They're going to, they're going to try to think it was some like, you know, the, just the way that people can perverse this subject. Yeah. I've got to tread lightly, obviously. Uh, cause that's not what it was. It wasn't like, you know, me killing Muslims. Yeah. 
I was killing terrorists. Yeah. That's what I was, that's what I was doing. Yeah. And I have buddies that are Muslim. Good people. Our interpreter wasn't a Muslim. And guess what? He killed a lot of people over there also. Yeah. Our, our interpreter was legit. He carried a full load out. He is what our interpreter is. I'm friends with him still on social media. I still talk to him to see how he's doing. Um, I would love to get him to the States. You know, yeah. I'd love to somehow find a way to help get him to the States. Yeah. Um, and I'd have him live with me and my family. That's how much I trust this guy. And I love this guy, yeah. dude. He killed more people in gunfights than probably all the frog men combined. <laughs> I'm, I'm not even exaggerating. This guy has been on more combat missions and patrols than anybody else. Mm -hmm. I mean, insane. I mean, he carried law, law rockets on his back for a guy, like carry extra loadout, extra gear. I mean, he was just yeah. uh, a true warrior. Yeah. So it was never a religion thing. It wasn't like, oh, I'm killing him because of this, this, and this. Well, that's well then that's not what christianity is like, yeah, right sure but it was i was I'm, I'm strong in my beliefs and i believe in god i believe that he has kept me alive when there are situations where i should not have come out on top and i know i know how i feel in regards to my faith yeah no like i said I, i'm know, sure somebody out there's going to try to twist well, what we just talked about but here's the good cool. news they can go fucking choke themselves <laughs> you you know i'm going to say it at least once every podcast yep. ladies and gentlemen um is there a a specific instance or two that you uh, would be willing to share with the listener in terms of a, a specific gun battle or, or operation mission that you can kind of put us in the driver's seat that stands out in your mind as being one of those like, holy fuck, I can't believe we made it out of that type of moment? Yeah, it was, uh, it was on May 16th, 2006. And uh, the reason why I, I just know that date is I mean that was a day that one of my bronze stars got upgraded to a silver star, which is just silly in my mind. It's like, man, I'd had this for ten years. Ten years later, the Navy, you know, Secretary of Navy was doing a review of all the all the awards that had been issued with Valor, and mine got upgraded to a, to a silver star. A handful of obviously other guys did as well. Um, military efficiency you know, some, uh, well yeah 10 years <laughs> 10 later, years later. Uh, some of the silver stars guys in our community that had silver stars got upgraded navy crosses uh, sure. so you hear those readouts and that was pretty awesome but uh, you know so it was May 16th we were uh, foot patrolling uh, through Ramadi you know we are in the Malab district and um, we were on North Stadium Road headed west and uh, myself I was walking point uh, another Marine gunny sergeant was towards the front of the patrol with us and he bumped across to the north side of the road. And so I bump across to be with them so he's not by himself. And at that time, as we're bumping across the street, we walked straight into an ambush and we had guys shooting down from elevated positions, you know, from courtyards behind vehicles. You know, you just, I, I opened up with my machine gun. I was carrying the Mark 46, which is a belt fed 556 five, machine gun. The box of ammo on the gun is, carries 200 rounds. It's a hornet's nest. Oh, that it's is. amazing. <laughs> you know, it's amazing. And then I had, you know, multiple other boxes on, on my, on my chest as well. And so returning cover fire, um, guys are making the calls. They're peeling back to a courtyard that we just passed. They're making their way into that courtyard. A couple of Iraqi soldiers got shot. And so they're like, you guys are grabbing them, trying to pull them in there. I mean, it was straight up hornet's nest, right? Yeah. Like you said, like we're there. And we had other guys in another overwatch position that were like, like they could kind of see what's going on, but they couldn't, they couldn't do anything, right? That's how far away they were in the city. And so myself and the gunny were on the other side of the street and we're laying down cover fire. We're engaging guys. He pops around to the north side to hold up the north side. He's laying down cover fire. I think he engages a couple guys up there as well. And then all of a sudden you just hear just that gate shut. It was crazy how loud combat was, everything else that was going on. Like to hear that gate just, just slam shut was, you know, look and you're like, fuck <laughs> yeah like we're out here by ourselves do you know ballpark how many insurgents you were going at? i have no idea. no idea i would say you know not not a crazy amount it was uh, less than a dozen but when they are moving around and from multiple locations and positions i mean it's enough to make it suck right sure. <laughs> and Everyone you know one yeah and they're also shooting from inside of windows and rooftops and behind stuff and you know these these guys would use kids as shields man yeah. absolute coward savages yeah. they would pick up women and children they would hold them in front of them while they would attack us right yeah. but that wasn't happening during this <clears throat> incident but that's just the way they operated so anyways we 
we've got to get back over there, across the street, laying down cover fire. And the gun, he's like, hey, I'm going to bump across, you know, cover my movement and I'll cover yours. And so I'm laying down cover fire. He bumps across, but instead of going all the way to the other side of the road, uh, he stops halfway to start laying down cover fire for so he can get a good angle of where he needs to be shooting. When he stops and faces west and starts laying down cover fire, he gets shot right above his kneecap mm. and just blows out the whole back of his leg. Instantly, he hits the ground. Well, there's now they're shooting at him laying in the street, right? I'm getting shot at. Like, there's bullets ricocheting around me. There's bullets ricocheting around him. I look at him and I just see the, the rounds like bouncing. At, and I'm like, if I go to him, I'm going to get shot, right? If I stay where I'm at, I'm going to get shot. Like, I had to make a decision. And I didn't, there was no decision to be made though. Like, I had to go to him. He was bleeding out in the middle of the street. Those guys were in the courtyard trying to fight off enemy fighters from elevated positions. They're trying to f deal with the wounded. Like, they, they've got all this shit going on. The fog of war is legit full going effect. full effect yeah and so i run out to him i'm laying down my own cover fire and i grab the the pull handle on the back of his body armor i just tuck my mark 46 under my shoulder and start laying down my own cover fire and i just start dragging Some him back fucking rambo shit <laughs> yeah, dude, <this> only, <laughs> like, you know, slinging I, lead from the hip yeah I, the yeah <laughs> I, well, I mean it was there's no other option yeah. you know it was just like that was the only way like i wasn't going to be able to sit there and roll on the ground and get him up over my shoulder yeah. or no you know no and so as i'm dragging him there's a marine that he wasn't in the courtyard and for whatever reason he was outside on the street still i think he's just right around the corner and i'm yelling i'm yelling for guys like somebody help me right like somebody get out here and help me because there's rounds ricocheting all around us like i'm trying to engage i see we're, we're getting shot at from multiple locations like i can't like I, I, can't, I can't get him to the gate fast enough. He was a big dude, you know, and he was carrying a radio. He had his full loadout. I mean, he was probably close to 300 pounds when yeah. it came to all of his gear. Yeah. And so I'm just like trying to pull him, trying to pull him. And uh, I actually trip over the curb as I'm walking backwards. Uh, I thought I got shot, right? Because now I'm like looking up <laughs> in the sky. Like I get back up, I'm pulling him. And the Marine comes out to help me. He gets shot in the body armor, stumbles back. Um, I'll show you when we, after the podcast, I'll show you a picture. I have a picture of his body armor. It was that high above the bottom of his body armor, oh, literally shit. an inch and a half lower. It would have gone into his abdomen and Holy probably God. would have killed him. Yeah. And so he gets shot, boom, he comes back, grabs him. We get him all the way to the gate. They open up the gate, reach out. They help pull us in, pull him in. We get him in there, start applying pressure to the femoral artery, trying to hold the back of his leg together. I mean, it's just like me putting my hands in mashed potatoes, man. It was just like just trying to stop the bleeding. I remember all the medic training yeah. that we had, you know, from SQT and just everything. Thank God. I, I still I thought about it, like the intense medical training that we did in workups, but even in SQT, and I remember you guys telling us, you win the fight first. Yeah, you, you win the to. fight yeah. because if you don't win the fight, everybody gets killed. Yeah, you have to win the fight, get the guy to a position, then you can start working on him, right? And I just yeah. remember how crazy you guys made the medic training, just like just yeah. simulating blood and just throwing stuff on us. So we had to work through that, and that's you know, so what we're trying to do. And I'm yelling for the corpsman, right? And Seth is working both of his radios. He keeps like stepping up onto this thing to go over the wall to like return uh, fire and engage enemy fighters that were trying to move in the streets and get up to other rooftops around us i'm screaming for the medic like this guy is gonna die right yeah. he looks over well he's working on a handful of iraqis that have been shot right and so mm -hmm. you talk about prioritize and execute our corpsman's like uh okay boom this guy's about to die he comes over here i wish i could say his name and give him props but he's out but he's a very private guy so yeah. i just i respect that sure he was such an amazing medic and what he was able to do I and mean, he absolutely saved that guy's life if he wouldn't have done what he did, that guy would have died, yeah. as well as many other guys on that deployment. And so we're doing all that stuff. He takes some of the medical stuff. I'm like, whew, wipe my face. I'm like, just, just wipe the sweat off my face, take a drink out of my camel back. It was like the best drink of water ever, right? <laughs> and Seth instantly was like, JP, I need you on the rooftop. We have enemy fighters moving on our position. Lay down. I need cover up top. And I'm like, Phew. Well, as I'm getting ready to move off to that rooftop, I felt my gun was light. So I stripped off the box and put a new box on, linked, uh, like, you know, linked those 
the belts, you know, together. The belts together as I'm running up the stairs. I get up to the rooftop. I'm like, all right, hey, you boom. I'm telling the guys where to go. We engage enemy fighters. There's guys that came up on the rooftops across the street that were trying to creep over so they could start shooting down in the courtyard cut those dudes in half with a machine yeah. gun we engage more guys to the west uh and we suppress the enemy fire we kill them all and and then he was able to call in the kazavak get gunny sergeant out of there get the other wounded guys out uh, but it's funny when i run up on the rooftop guys are like like looking at me like something was wrong i didn't realize it when i wiped the sweat off my face at all that blood in my gloves from stopping <laughs> bleeding. So, brave heart walking up the yeah, <laughs> like so i think they thought i got wounded or something yeah. happened um but it's, uh, you know, it's, yeah, that was, that was insane, you know, but all the other days weren't too far off from that. Yeah. And, you know, I just remember us realizing, oh, this is what it's like, you know, and we were there. I mean, that was like that from day one, but that was, you know, the big, the big thing, you know, the, and it was a couple weeks prior, maybe it was just a week prior is when Cowie got shot. And that's when Mikey got Silver Star yeah. and the other guy, the Badger, got the Silver Star for what he did for, for what they did for Cowie. Yeah. Uh, and that was that was the first, that was hard when you hear your brother over the radio go, I'm shot, I'm shot. Mm-hmm. Seth, this is Cowie, I'm shot. And you hear in the distance is, bah, 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 just massive gunfire. <clears throat> and you know that's Mikey because I, I know that gun. Yeah. Um, and we're not close to him. Hmm. and we just take off we're like we clap security and we just we're running through the streets laying down our own cover fire to get to them and that was another time that was just like dude like and that one was it wasn't as intense because by the time we got there you know mikey and this other guy had already killed the enemy fighters that were moving on them uh luckily they knew where they were at we knew where they're at so seth got on the radio while we were sprinting through the streets and was calling in the medevac for them and called in for humvee and tank support and they got there but to hear your brother over the radio just this tone completely different and then while he's talking on the radio telling us that he's been shot mikey's shooting his machine gun so now you hear that machine gun fire come through the radio as well it was it was a sickening feeling man yeah and it was just you, you feel helpless like yeah. you're like i can't do anything right now yeah. the only thing we could do was to move them run towards a gunfire and and just figure out what we're going to be able to do when we got there yeah fucking christ man that's some intense shit i mean i know i remember being back on the strand while while that deployment was going on and getting bits and pieces of uh of yeah. some of the uh after actions and stuff and i was just like oh, the same thing like hearing some of the stories with the you know medal of honor recipients and stuff i'm just like those cocksuckers yeah you know, i was like god damn it you know like it's like you know all of the all of the moons are aligned like just right for you guys to have this epic fucking it planet. wasn't like we we're any better than anybody else we just we were in the situation and we we did our job that's yeah. all we did and people are always like try to make it make it seem like something greater or our task unit was something yeah. greater than we were i mean yeah we were a great task unit yeah I, I but think, that's because we believed we were and we put in the work. But yeah. we did. We were just doing our job. That's the thing people don't understand. We were just doing our job. That's what Chris would tell people all the time. And yeah, you know, so I told people, I was like, I was just doing my job, man. Yeah. Like I, you know, Nicholas that you had on your podcast, like reading his book, listening to his story, like. I want to be friends with him. Like <laughs> I want us, dude. you know what I mean? Like that, yeah. you just you want to be friends you, with everybody. <laughs> yeah. I, well, that is true. I want to be friends with everybody, but you know, you, you hear those stories and then he was like, well, I was just doing my job. Yeah. Like we're no, we weren't special. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, again, I think it's humility as is playing a big role in that. I think, you know, task, you know, bruiser at, the, at that time, like, between the leadership and, and, you know, I think leadership plays a huge role for not just the obvious reasons of leadership, but also from a selection standpoint is that, you know, having, having your back and going to bat to make sure you're on deployment vice, you know, maybe some other guys that yeah. wouldn't have been as dependable. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, I, I think leadership is multifaceted in terms of how big of a role it plays in terms of the, of, uh, you know, the, the varsity caliber and magnitude of dudes that, that end up in, in those uh, task units and squad. And we had to whatever. fire guys before deployment, yeah. which is crazy. People don't, don't understand know. that. Like, you know, we literally removed guys' tridents from their chest, sent them out to the fleet navy, yeah. fired officers because they didn't perform. Yeah. Same and, here. I mean, and that's what people don't understand is how important leadership is. I mean, leadership is everything. And, and, and earning it every day. You know, earning that trident every fucking day. Absolutely. Man. You know, and... um 
and but people get focused on leader. I was talking to one of my good buddies at the gym the other day, and he was like frustrated at work. And I'm kind of like, bro, step up, step yeah. up and lead. And he's like, oh, I can't. Really. I'm like, yes, you can. You absolutely can. Because leadership is at every level. Leadership goes up and down the chain of command. Yeah. And it wasn't great leadership that we had from Jocko or the the commanding officer at SEAL Team Three, or the you know the the general in charge of the battle space we were in. It was leadership at every level. Mm-hmm. That is what I think made <clears throat> Task Unit Bruiser stand out for all the other task units. Is because Jocko instilled that into every single one of us. Yeah. And the soldiers and Marines that we worked with were the same way. Mm-hmm. Same way. They all yeah. stepped up and led. And the good companies that we work with, the companies that thrive, the companies that bring us in. To, to work with them, it's because they realize that leadership makes a difference. Sure, yeah, yeah. And everything. Sure. Yeah. No, hey, amen. It's a lot, a lot of really good, good lessons learned uh, in so many different facets of that. Um, is there one uh, Overwatch sniper story you could share uh, similarly in terms of made a big difference or sticks out in your mind as being, um, you know, a day that, uh, you know, is, is more remembered than, than the rest? Yeah, I have a I have a couple that are up there. Um, one of them I remember we we're up on a building. It's I mean we we engaged multiple guys that day, and um, you know, that's why I have issues with TBIs and just the my pituitary gland is all messed up from all that trauma and, and stuff like that. Is you know, up on the rooftop, the wall was right directly right next to me, but I had to be that close to the wall for the loophole charge. <laughs> I mean you're shooting a 300 win mag. And I found one of my old sniper log books, and I mean the, the 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 round that we were firing was 190 grains. God damn, and that's what's <laughs> like 3,200 feet per second, bro. And then the, was, the energy out of that is fucking barn door so, in your ass. So think about it. There's a wall. There's a yeah. there's a, a mortar wall right next to you. Guess where all that concussion and blast is yeah, going? Right in your fucking right mouth. Right back into your head, right? And so we engaged with a couple guys that day, and I just remember every time I took a shot, I just be like, oh. Just, it was just killing me. And so there's, but there's multiple enemy fighters in this position. They're down there, like hiding in this market. And you can actually like see them in the market. Cause I mean, I had 300 wind mag that I was rocking with the night force scope, which is the best glass out there by, I mean, you know, uh, I've always wanted to go just talk with night force <laughs> and be like, Hey, this is what your scope did for me on deployment. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That's it. You know what I mean? Just yeah. like, Hey, thank you for making such a good quality product. And uh, anyways, you have that large magnification, boom, zooming in. We see the guys that are in there, start engaging guys. And so I tell the guys on the rooftop what's going on, and they all come up, and I actually found the video on one of my old laptops. And Mike, who's with us now, Mike Sorelli, comes up. He law rocket. He is standing right above me. Oh, he fires a law rocket. I'm on my weapon. He fire engaging guys. He fires a law rocket. Machine gunners come up over the wall. Mikey and a, the other guys are machine gunners. They come up. They're engaging. Then guys come up. Uh, with the, was it the SBR? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So they came up and they're you know seven sure. six two, and uh, is Seth and another guy they're engaging. Uh, Sorelli comes back up with another, you know, and they're just like, and I'm laying underneath them like engaging guys at the same. It's all this stuff was going on at once. It was just. That was psychotic. Like, yeah. that was crazy. <laughs> and, and, for, and for the listener, if you don't know, a law rocket stands for a light uh, anti armor weapon, I think. Yep. Um, and it, yep. it's a 66 millimeter fucking bazooka uh, <laughs> with a back blast that'll uh, make you shit your fucking pants. So, uh, not quite like the, the AT4 or the Carl Gustav, yeah. the 84 millimeter, but still uh, packs a hell of a punch, especially in a, in a closed environment. I, you know, no wonder your fucking eggs are a little scrambled. Yeah. Um, so, so that was one of them that were it was just like yeah you know was that anything that we trained to do hell no yeah. not even close it was just one of the things that we you know just guys were like hey this is what we got to do the, everyone was reading and reacting off each other and it was just you know one of the yeah. things that i remember mike like afterwards mike's like hey bro are you okay because i was just like laying there on my i'm sure i was like, like drooling huh? on myself <laughs> and um you know, but we but we got those guys, yeah. and we killed those guys that were trying to flank on some guys that were patrolling through the streets. Yeah. They were trying to set up an ambush, and they had no idea we were up on this rooftop. Yeah. It was fucking. Brilliant. It was beautiful. Yeah. It was I so awesome. Uh, and then another time, um, you know, I missed a shot, and that's a horrible feeling. Can I missed a it? shot, but I got right back on the gun, and that's the thing. I was I was just on a podcast last week, and I was talking to these guys. We we're doing some filming 
Um, for Origin, they have, you know, like I was telling you, that discipline, the can yeah. go drink that they have coming out. They're doing some stuff for that. And we were talking about, you know, they're asking, like, have you ever missed a shot? You know, because guys are, you know, other snipers are like, I've never missed a shot. I'm like, well, you're, <laughs> full, full, you're full of it, bro. <laughs> uh, but when we'd push ourselves in training, to the point where you miss a shot, right? And yeah. to where when you miss a shot, you need to feel that. You need to recognize. It's just, it's hard to explain, but if you do it enough times, I know when I take a shot, it's a miss. Like I know that it, I, it's going to be a miss. But while that gun is in recoil, you just fired off a shot, you're off target, your, your head's moved around. What can you be doing? Well, you have to be efficient with your motions, efficient with your movement. And so, hey, bolt, jet that round, chamber a new round, dude get it ready, finger back on the trigger, get, you know, my eye, find my eye relief again, get back on target and reevaluate. Re right. Yeah. And so I, boom, I did it. I knew I missed. Like I just knew it was a, it was a guy that was moving. It was a moving target. I knew that I missed. I got right back on the gun. And of course, you know, the guy hears he got shot at, so he's running. So now I'm having to take a shot on a guy that's sprinting yeah. and it just, everything, everything just clicked. Like the training that we did, clicked in and i just remember adjusting my lead and as i was adjusting the lead and following him just pulling out the trigger and just blew out the right side of his chest as it, it you know entered in and spun him around and he was laying out in the street and i just remember like the feeling of that miss but not allowing that feeling to consume me yeah. because if i would have just been like oh my gosh i missed and did nothing well that would have been a bad guy that got Got no away. Way. Yeah. And he probably would have went and killed innocent people or killed soldiers and Marines that were patrolling the streets. Yeah. And so I just remember feeling that, you know. Oh, that's um, a fucking great lesson. The uh, Was that the 300 Win Mag? Yeah. That 190 grain bullet, for those of you that aren't super familiar with ballistics, I mean, that's fucking brutal. Um, yeah. To give you an idea, like the, the standard, you know, what you hear in the media all the time, the AR-15, you know, the M4 that we shoot generally shoots a 55 grain yeah. green tip round, which is nasty in and of itself, but you're talking about you know, over three times the size, yeah. uh, size fucking round. And it's going the same goddamn speed. Uh, I am curious in, in bringing that up real quick. Uh, was that kind of your sniper rifle of choice or was there? So the SR 25 was actually originally my sniper rifle <clears throat> of choice in an urban environment because you have a magazine of 20 rounds. Yeah. It can go semi-automatic mm -hmm. and I was our point man. So both. if I was walking point to go do a sniper overwatch, I carried my sniper rifle. Yeah. If I was walking point just to patrol the streets and I wasn't acting as a sniper, I carried the Mark 46 because yeah. why would I not want a yeah. machine gun yeah. and point? Or if I was in rear security, which I got into, I, I got a handful of my kills also just patrolling rear security because they try to flank from behind and mm -hmm. come around yeah. and they cover, you know, and it's just like, dude, like you see them coming, you hear them coming over the radio, you, you, you know that they're coming and you're just waiting, right? Yeah. And they come around and, yeah. You know, it's, it's a beautiful thing, you know, yeah. but for the urban environment, the SR-25 was awesome because yeah. I could shoot semi-automatic if I had to, had a decent scope on the gun, yeah. and it was a pretty accurate gun. And in an urban environment, you're not reaching out. Past a few hundred, usually. You know, you know I, have, I, have, I have longer kills, you know, that 870, which is long in an urban environment. It was just like one of those unique situations. But yeah, most of the time, you know, unless you're on the outskirts of the city where there's like fields or you know, rural areas that we operated in sometimes, yeah, okay, that yeah. you're going to reach out. But in the city, three, 500 yards, I mean, you know, yeah. and so the SR-25 was great for that. But then at the time, we didn't know the SR-20, the, the dust cover was causing malfunctions, and you're in an urban environment, riding in tanks, riding in the back of Bradley vehicles. We'd load up in dump trucks and have them drive us into the city from base. And we'd offload the dump trucks, secure a building. So guess what? The dust cover is going to be closed, right? Yeah. But then when it's you shoot true. it, it would cause a malfunction. And what was crazy is we'd known about that. The teams, I'm sorry, the teams had known about that, that for years, yet nobody passed that on. Like that was not like Thanks, a buddy. Yeah. And so we found out it, we found that out in Ramadi. And so it was like, Oh, okay. So when that was happening, I was like, man, I, I can't, I can't risk that. Like yeah. that can't happen. I can't get one shot off and then have to be clear and malfunction. Yeah. And so I just started carrying the 300 wind mag as my sniper rifle. And dude, it's, I mean, it's much more effective and accurate than the SR 25. I could reach out that night force scope was insane it was absolutely amazing and so it was good and but then i was having a patrol with another weapon and carry 
yeah. that 300 win mag with that load out and everything <clears throat> else like that. And towards the end of deployment, um, I might have gotten a little crazy. Like, <laughs> guys were like, bro, like my, Derek, you know, I was like, dude. I'm hearing that you're patrolling with a 300 wind mag. I was walking point carrying a 300 wind mag, bro. Gun. Yeah, exactly. like, what the hell? But uh, hey, I always had Mikey. You yeah. know, Mikey was always right by yeah. me. And hey, what's better? You yeah. know, what I mean, I'm gonna have the machine gun start laying down cover fire and peel back. I'm gonna get, I'm gonna go Im- immediately to get the high ground. And uh, but yeah, so yeah. 300 wind mag was you know. It's an amazing, yeah. amazing gun. Yeah. Did, did you keep track of uh, successful sniper shots? Yeah, we did. You know, we uh, we tried to, but there's a lot of times where, you know, we're just in yeah. firefights and engaging guys, and there was just, um, you know, you're not actually getting the shooter. St- or, you know, we'd get shooter statements, obviously, when we're engaging guys and, and getting the troops in contact and the little ticks. Uh, but you know, for the ones that they're being tracked, as far as confirmed, you know, you had to have somebody else witness it, and it was, you know, all that stuff as well. So yeah, we we tracked as much as we could, but um, it was just, um, you know, what, what our task unit was able to do. You know, I I know all the official numbers that guys have, and we had as a task unit, but we also all know. That it was, it Way was more than that. far greater yeah. than that. You, you know, every asshole listening right now wants to know what that number is. And my answer always is not enough. Not enough. I got you. That's, <laughs> I, I just, I don't, I don't, it was a good amount. Yeah. And I just, yeah. but it literally, the the honest answer is not enough. Yeah. Right. It's just, yeah. That's it just my, wasn't. That's one of my favorite answers. It's like, what do you feel when you Sh- kill somebody, somebody fucking recoil? Recoil you know? the weapon. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's fucking, it's good stuff. Um, all right, so fucking tons of good uh, deployment stories. I know we could spend you know a, f- a few days talking about uh, cutting people in half and, <laughs> and not killing enough people and uh, and everything. But uh, I wanted to talk about uh, kind of the the transition from you know coming back and getting out of the Navy and and what uh, if you could kind of explain what that process was like, both just what took place, but then also where where your head was at because I know. For me and for a lot of guys like us, that, that is a difficult transition to make. Uh, one where I think, for a lot of the veterans listening, and, and you know, so many of you that I've talked to and, and had people ask me questions about what that's like, of you know, you, you feel a little bit lost. You know, I know for me, like, and the same as you, coming in the Navy at, at 18 and getting out when I was 30, like, you know, that's like I, we grew up in the SEAL teams, you know, yeah. and, and so our entire adult lives, I man, I went from living with my parents to boot camp to spending over a decade as a team guy. And then now I'm out like you like you feel kind of fucking lost, you know, and, and I'm curious to get, uh, you know, your experience of what that was like. I mean, I was absolutely lost. Um, you know, I got out to try to make things work with my current wife and be there for for her and the kids and you know she was going to move to san diego um with uh with aiden aiden's aiden's my stepson i call him my bonus boy you know he, <laughs> I, mean, he I consider him my son he is yeah. my son you know and uh him and his his dad and i we have a really good relationship as well and, and so it's it's awesome and so um you know amanda and aiden were going to move out to san diego and then she found out she was pregnant with twins and she was like uh you know and I was pissed, man. I was really upset and frustrated with her, and I was super angry that she wasn't going to move there. But you know, she's a small town Mississippi girl. You know, and all of a sudden, her coming out to San Diego with Aiden it was just going to be a lot. And you know, she's leaving her mom and all of her friends. And did you, you know, meet her on a training trip? Yeah, I met her out in uh, in Mississippi yeah. when I was going out to Shaw's every other month. Um, and you know, we were doing the long distance dating and, you know, anyway, so that didn't happen and I needed to make a decision cause I had been at the training command for, in my mind too long, you know, mm-hmm. and that's why I deployed to Afghanistan when I was at the training command. Um, and I was trying to, to go to go somewhere else within the teams or I needed to get back into a platoon and, and get <clears throat> and, and, and do what team guys are supposed to do, which is deployed if you're healthy and able to do. Yeah. Right. And so that's the kind of where I was at. And, you know, I just, I'd already had a failed marriage and I just, uh, it was where I needed to be going, you yeah. know, and, and I, I miss it every day. I hate being out of the teams, but at the time it was, it was what I needed to do. Um, you know, there's a good amount of team guys are actually like legit pissed at me for getting out. And I was like, you know, I, at the end of the day, like I, I love the teams and I love the brotherhood and there's, you know, I, I hope that I live my life to honor, you know, our brotherhood. 
Um, but my my wife and kids are going to be there until the day I die, you yeah. know? And I needed to put Amanda and Aiden first and our <clears throat> our twin daughters that were on their way. Mm. And so that, that's what was my... Uh, decision to get out. And so I start doing sales at a financial company in Memphis, Tennessee. So you go from being an active duty Navy SEAL where your job is the absolute best job in the world. You get paid to work out and do combatives and shoot and blow stuff up and do mission planning and train guys and go, you know, it's the best job ever to, I am now wearing a suit and tie sitting in traffic, going to an office every day. And then sometimes I got to travel to do sales calls. It sucked. Yeah. Now I will say that the guys I worked with were awesome. You know, the company I worked at, I believed in our product, and so I enjoyed sales. I enjoyed also learning business and learning something new, and you know, I was kind of drawn to that. Um, and I liked the aspect that you you eat what you hunt. So mm-hmm. if you're going to make a sale, you get paid. If you don't make a sale, guess what? You don't get paid. Yeah. And so I really enjoyed that. Um, and the guys I worked with, um, the, the sales guys, you know, Heath was a former Marine, uh, Sam and Josh and Joe, and it was and myself. It was just us, right, for a big multi-million dollar company. They taught me so much because, like you said, the teams is all I knew. Yeah. You know, I graduated high school and I'll, you know, living with my mom and dad, do construction with my dad that summer. Then I'm in the boot, I'm in boot camp, I'm in SEAL teams. The SEAL teams is all I knew as being an adult, Hmm. you know. And now when your job isn't, you know, do what we did, it it was, they taught me a lot, a lot about the outside, a lot about business and just, you know, it was just crazy. It was cool. And so I'm forever grateful for those, for those four guys and what they taught me. Uh, One of the, you know, to the owners of the company, they're awesome. One of them I still talk to regularly. He's he was a very big influence in helping me just learn about life outside of the military and, and the teams. And so I was lost though. And I had no mission. You know, uh, I didn't, you know, we're very mission driven and oriented. And That's now right. I have a mission. Now you have a mission. <coughs> I didn't have a mission when I got out. And um, I was also dealing with my body not producing testosterone because of the issues with my pituitary gland and the TBIs and everything else like that. So I had a, you know, I didn't know it was a couple of years, man, that until I actually got on TRT. So you talk about your body being completely out of whack, how it affects you, you know, the psychological effects of low testosterone is people don't understand how horrible that is. Yeah. I personally feel that I've, Everyone I've talked to that we've dove deep into this little rabbit hole agree with me. The issues with veterans and law enforcement and first responders killing themselves is because of low T. No, I would agree, hundred percent. I will put everything on that yeah. because or, of, or overwhelmingly so, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, yes, a yeah. large, yeah. a large percentage. You know that if you fix that, it wouldn't be even be a thought process or issue for these guys. Yeah. Um, but this isn't a podcast about that. So, we'll, I mean, maybe we'll talk about it some other time with someone yeah. who's an expert on that because I think that message needs to be heard and, and, and shared. And, and so that's what I was dealing with, right? And so I was a horrible father. I was a horrible husband. I was a horrible friend to everybody around me. And I thought... I wanted to talk to you about that, you know, for that couple of years at none. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I just <laughs> want to bring that up to you. Not now that you're here and the, and the mic's on. Yeah. Um, and I thought MMA would be you know would fill that void can I, and it helped can i interrupt real yes. quick the, did you uh know about the low testosterone prior like were you doing mma while you were low yeah no shit like that's a, that's a weird <laughs> i know fucking dichotomy yeah and a lot of people are like i don't wait what really yeah. so but and i was just talking about this on another podcast i just was like you know it's crazy with the the human body can do and what our brain is able to do is I would literally have to do, I would sometimes be, my testosterone would be so low. When I finally went and got it tested, it was 81. God damn. 81. And the normal range is like four to 800, right? Well, 400 is low. That's when they start giving you TRT. The range for guys my age at the time, early 30s, were supposed to be between uh, seven to 900. Yeah. You know, and if you get in the 600s, you could probably get some TRT because you're getting low. 400s is like, no question, you're boom. 81. That is yeah. dangerously you're basically low. basically a chick. 
I mean, no. Chicks in junior <laughs> high had more testosterone than Fuck. I did. And so I, was, I wasn't sleeping. I was tired. I, literally, I could barely get through my day. I was drinking six to seven monsters a day. Oh, um, and, you know, it was just bad. But then I'd go to the gym to train. And it was like the, that was a piece of the teams, right? Mm -hmm. That competition, just sweating, working hard, bleeding with your, you know, going, you know, just fighting with these guys and training for fights. Um, I, could, I could turn it on. It was really weird. Uh, but yeah, those are times where I was just, you know, had, I wasn't even on TRT yet. I, like I didn't know, you know, and it was, it was a really bad time. So all that stuff was going on. Amanda and I were just fighting. I mean, it was, it was horrible between the two of us. I mean, there's multiple times that I moved out and was actually living with a buddy out there. Uh, I didn't know anybody out there. You know, I moved away from everything I knew. I didn't have family out there. Uh, it was just, you know, it was a rough little transition, um, but it was nobody else's fault other than mine. You know, and that's the thing is guys want to transition out and they have all these issues. They want to blame everybody else. No, at the end of the day, that was 100% my fault. I should have been more squared away when I got out of the military. I should have planned more. I should have done more research. I should have taken care of my body better. I should have done more stuff with medical and the military. There's all these things that I could have done, right? And for the longest time, I didn't go get my testosterone checked because of my ego. Yeah. I was like, that ain't an issue. Yeah. I got, pl I'm all man. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm good. I'm good to go, you know? And it was just like, <clears throat> okay, cool. That's like one aspect. Like, yeah. good. You can have sex with your wife. That's great. Yeah. However, Boom, 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 right? And it was just all these other things that play into it. And so it was it was rough. And then Amanda and I actually got divorced. No shit. Completely divorced, like full on. She served me with divorce papers because I was being such an awesome person to her. Yeah. And she was dealing with some stuff for herself. And we were, we were just horrible, selfish people. We didn't take the time to communicate. We didn't put each other first like you're supposed to in a marriage, in a relationship. Um, and we got divorced. And then I was still working at this financial company, started making more money than I'd ever made before. You know, I was making six, you know, in the six figures. And I was like, you got to be kidding me. I have a high school diploma, like I'm military. I'm now making over a hundred grand a year. Like, come yeah, on. Yeah. But I was miserable. Like the money, that's the thing. The money didn't matter. Like I didn't have a family. Like mm -hmm. I only got to see my kids a couple days a week. Aiden, who I loved, I only got to see a couple days a week. And I still loved Amanda, you know, and you know, we're doing our own thing and it was just, we kept getting drawn back to each other and we end up getting back together. Uh, we go to church and, um, there was a, we go to church together and there was a, a small group that they're advertising in the church and they had one for couples. Long story short, short, she was just like, Hey, you know, I think we should do this. And I was like, yeah, we should. And if it doesn't work, we are completely done. Like if we if we go to a small group at church that's four couples yeah. and we still can't figure it out, you and I just need to be best friends yeah. because I can't do this back and forth. You can't do it. And, and she was wore out. Like what I put her through when we were divorced was just unfair, right? Yeah. It, I was, it was just bad and she couldn't take it and yeah. she didn't deserve that anymore. Yeah. And so we make it work and we figured out, you know, and then also is about this time extreme ownership came out and I read Jocko and Lace book and I was like, you've got to be kidding me. Like everything that I knew from the teams, I never applied to my marriage. Not once. Yeah. Not once did I ever apply what made me a good seal. And I'm not being cocky. I like saying, Oh, I'm a great seal, but you know, I was a no, it was good in the, in the seal teams because of what I was taught from Jocko and Lace and those guys. No, not once did I ever do that with my family. Yeah. It made me disgusted in myself because, you know, and I remember one time Amanda's like, you've never quit in your life except for you quit on our marriage. Yeah. You've never quit anything else, but yet you just, you quit on our marriage. And I was just like, okay. And it was true. Yeah. You know, and I was just like, it was just bad, but you know, and I'll say, you know, she took ownership of her stuff as well, you know, and we, we both worked on it and it's, it's been rough, you know, it's been, it takes time, you know, and we still stuff we deal with and struggle with, but us learning how to communicate has been the absolute deal breaker in, in, in a good way. Yeah. Right. That's what got us away from game changer. all that stuff. The, yes. Yeah. The game changer was, yeah. um, was that like I said? I don't, I don't like talking in front of people, and I know people yeah. are listening, so I mix up words in my mind sometimes. <laughs> right. I'm like, it was a deal breaker. Yeah, You're like, hey, what, idiot. That's, that's what that's I'm here a, for. That's a game changer. I, I, do, I do it all the time. <laughs> yeah, um, it, you know, it's interesting you say that because the 
there, there's so many elements in, in dog training. And, and when I was on Jocko's podcast, it was, you know, he, he was like, you know, reading through your book, Team Dog, he's like, the parallels between, you know, human and canine leadership, like are exact, you know, the medium in which you apply them are obviously different, but, but the principles behind them are the exact mm-hmm. same thing. And, and I found myself same exact shit, you know, like I preach over and over to people all goddamn day long, like you need to do this, you need to not do that, you need to fucking take care of this, you need to, hand, you know, whatever. And then sometimes when I when I hold myself accountable and 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 self reflect, I'm like, fucking Christ, I need I need to slap the shit out of myself and take my own goddamn advice, you know. Like yeah. I find myself saying that regularly. Um, you know? Well, you know, one of the, one of Leif's one of the things that I love the most that Leif says is, it's not what you preach, it's what you tolerate. Yeah. And that applies to our own lives. Okay. And that's what I've really taken that on heart. It's like, hey, you know, obviously Jocko's discipline equals freedom is, I mean, that's life changing for people. Yeah. When people realize and understand how you can apply discipline to your life, it'll change your life. Yeah. Just as important is, is, is what life says. It's yeah. not what you preach, it's what you tolerate. Yeah. And that's with your team <clears throat> and with yourself. Yeah. What do you allow yourself to get away with? What What are your standards? Do you actually hold the line when it comes to your life? And yeah. you know, you say all this stuff, but what are you actually doing? And and that was that's been a game changer for us as well, you know. And so I, I left the financial company I was working at because I wanted to do something else. I wanted to teach law enforcement tactics, training, and shooting and combatives. I was just drawn to work with them and help them. And so I started a company called Never Settle Consulting. And uh, I got that from just, you know, the mindset that we had in the teams was never settle. You never settle for average, you're right? We're always pushing ourselves. We always hold each other accountable. And I was hoping that would be like a lifestyle type of brand, you know, yeah. one day. And I've actually had guys that have gotten like the company logo tattooed on them. And That's I, I thought it was pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, then and it, creepy. No. Yeah, yeah, and then it, <laughs> yeah, I always thought it was super cool, and um, and then uh, it morphed into an apparel company because the shirts <clears throat> that I was making up for the shooting classes and stuff that I was doing, people were like, "Hey, can we buy those?" And I was like, "Uh, sure." So I made a Facebook post, yeah. and one of my best friends that I grew up with, Danny, he actually lived out in this area. He had an apparel company, and um, I make the post. And I'm like, hey, you know, this is what I'm thinking. You know, his wife designs the T-shirts. We had 107 orders, not 107 shirts, but 107 orders within a week. Yeah. And I let him know the numbers, and he's like, I think you might have just started an apparel company, yeah. bro. <laughs> like, and so yeah. he starts making all my shirts. We start making hats, and like, I'm doing, I'm selling T-shirts and hats, right? And now yeah. I'm going to MMA fight shows to sell T-shirts and hats, and I'm doing this to help make ends meet to cover bills to rent the truck i was uh i was an extra in transformers five i actually played a navy seal which is funny yeah, yeah. uh we did some advising for the movie um and so it, it was really cool uh, but i made made a lot of bad decisions you know i made a lot of emotional decisions when it came to business and as yeah. i'm sure you're aware that's, oh, yeah. that's the killer destroy you yeah. and i was i was never very logical i was always a very emotional person and um you know, that's one of the things that Leif has really helped me just work on over, you know, the years and especially now working with Echelon Front is just being, just stepping back, detaching, being, being logical in my thought process. And, um, you know, I learned those lessons and put my family in some very hard, bad positions, man. I mean, it was to the point where I was, you know, waking up on Wednesday mornings at 3, 3, 15 in the morning. I was driving up to Nashville to work construction with my buddy. I would sleep in an extra bed that he had up in his attic. And then I'd do that Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Friday, I'd get done with work from him. I'd drive back down to South Haven. I'd see a man and the kids, whether they're at her parents' house or our house, love on them a little bit. And then I'd go deliver pizzas until 12 or 1 in the morning. No shit. Yeah, and I was doing that to make extra money. Uh, the tips is the extra money that I needed for my family. And I was doing like, I was rebuilding fences on the weekends. Uh, I was even like spray painting, like in front of like houses, like, so the address could be on the curb, yeah. you know, put a little layout, put the white spray paint down and then put the numbers over it and do the black. And that's why I would charge people $20, do a couple handful of those a weekend, make an extra couple hundred dollars. I was just anything I could to make ends meet for my family. Yeah. Uh, be, and you know, was I frustrated? Yeah. But guess what? I put myself in a <clears throat> position and it was about this time that I had the opportunity to start working with Jocko and Leif. 
And it was just, you know, I had to make that decision of what was I going to be all in on, you know? And I remember I came home from work one night from delivering pizzas. And that night I'd actually been, I was helping clean up, do the dishes and all this other stuff, um, which is crazy to think about is what I did in the military, my yeah, career. No. And then I'm delivering pizzas and I'm <clears throat> cleaning out a clogged drain in the back of the kitchen. And it's all full of just disgusting just dirty water because these young kids working there don't understand that you can't shove food down the drain yeah. and it'll clog, you know, and so I'm can't throw your tampons down. Yeah, the- I was just like, it was so disgusting. Yeah. I was just like, I'm like up to my elbow in this deep sink water. And I was just like, I just laughed at myself. I'm like, what are you doing? Yeah. Like you're, I could have been done when I was done delivering, but I was staying an extra hour or two so I could get that extra six seventy five an hour. Because that's what I needed. You know what I mean? And yeah. I was like, I was so frustrated with myself. I wasn't mad at anybody else. It was 100% my doing. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I go home that night and I sneak into the house so I don't wake up a man and the kids with the garage door opening up. I just park the truck out in the driveway, <laughs> come in the front door. And I remember looking in the bedroom. Uh, we, we lived in a two bedroom house with five kids, which, hey, I'm not complaining. It's not a bad environment. Other people live in a one-bedroom house, right? Or a studio that doesn't even have a bedroom with their families. I get it. But I remember looking in there. Aiden's in his bed. Amanda's laying in the bed on the floor with the girls on either side of her. She's just wore out. You could tell she's stressed. You know, I've been gone all week. I'm gone that night. And I was just, I got, you know, I, I got super upset with myself. And I had tears in my eyes. And I'm looking at my family. And I'm wondering, like, what in the hell are you doing? Like, what are you doing? And it was, I made the decision that night that I not was, it was not going to happen anymore, right? And so that's when I started studying everything I could about business, right? I was fulfilling online orders for Never Settle until three in the morning. I was learning how to do like advertising online for Never Settle. I was trying to, you know, do as much as I could to help Jocko and Leif and come on board with them. And it was at that time that they were bringing me on board. So I was listening to the podcast, listening, studying business, watching videos of people speak, watching videos of Jocko speak, watching videos of Leif speak. I would listen listen to audio that I recorded of Leif giving his presentation, of Jocko giving his presentation. I would four, five, six, sometimes up to eight hours a day, I would listen to their presentations while I was clicking through the presentation myself, making it my own. And I was all in. I mean, that's all I would do because I was so fed up with where I was at that I had to make a decision. Yeah. You want your life to change? get to work. Yeah. Don't hope it's going to change. Don't think it's going to change. Don't wish it's going to change. You actually have to take action, yeah. you know? And it was until I did that and took action that my life was just, I was existing. And mm-hmm. now I can say two years later, and just think about it, that was two years ago. That's crazy. Two years ago. This month, I have a picture of, in my phone, I saved it as a favorite. You know, this month, two years ago, I was delivering pizzas. I remember taking that picture and sending it to Jocko and Jocko was like, fuck bro. He's like, stay on the path. It's going to change. Cause that's right when they are bringing me on board. Right. Hmm. But Hey, nobody wanted JP Donnell to come speak to their company. Why would you, when you could have Jocko or Leif, right? And it was going to take some time. I was, I was going to have to build up my name, my reputation and do the free gigs and do the gigs that barely paid to build it up. Just like they did at the very beginning. You know, now you want Jocko to come talk to your company for an hour keynote. It's 82 a, grand. You better take out a second goddamn mortgage. Yeah, same with Leif. You know, <laughs> yeah. Leif's super high up there. You know, it's yeah. like, but guess what? The value they bring is worth it 10 times yeah. for if your company actually applies what they talk yeah. about, right? And so I knew that's where I was going to be. Like, yeah. I knew one day that's where I was going to be. So I w- it was ready to get to work. And the most important thing is Amanda and I sat down and we were on the same page and we said, hey, it's going to take a lot of hard work. Yeah. It's going to take a lot of sacrifice. This is our goal. And we went, you know, we came up with a game plan together. She has ownership of everything I do. She helps me out. The kids as well, like, you know, they know I'm going on the road. They'll help me pack little things once in a while or yeah. they'll leave me notes. And, you know, so two years ago, it's crazy. Two years ago, I was delivering pizzas. And then now, you know, last week, I did a keynote with O'Reilly Auto Parts to 7,000 people here in Dallas. That's fuck. I mean, like that that fucking story and that transition is is incredible, man. 
I mean, it really is. Like, I'm proud as fuck. I appreciate uh, it. Of everything that you've done. I mean, I'm just so, but I'm so fortunate for the opportunity that Jocko and Leif gave me. Yeah, you know? no, for I sure. mean, and, you know, and being able to work with guys like Dave Burke, you know, he, Dave Burke was a Top Gun fighter pilot with us in Ramadi. No shit. He was on the streets who patrolled with us in Ramadi. It just, he's another instructor. And then Flynn Cochran, I actually was Flynn's buds instructor. You no know? shit. And then he came through <laughs> when I was at Trade at, and, you know, he, grad, he got out of the SEAL teams. He went to Harvard Business School got his business degree from harvard yeah. i mean one of the, just insanely smart guys went on was a consultant with mckinsey group mike sorelli you know we're bringing on two other guys that you know they're still in so i'm not gonna say the names but like those are the guys i get to work with you yeah. know and i was thinking you know in 2017 hands down the two most influential people in my life was jocko and life yeah no doubt right no question and then I was thinking about it the other day, and I saw a picture of myself and Flynn and Dave at the muster. And in 2018, the two most influential guys in my life were Flynn Cochran and Dave Burke because yeah. of what they invested into me. And not only just from a friendship standpoint, from, from just like knowing, I don't know what they know when it comes to business, mm -hmm. but the amount of time that they put into me to work with me, to help me, just to be there for me no matter what, like anytime I had a question or just in conversation, those guys hands down when it comes to being a husband, a father, uh, uh, in business, like those two guys are the most influential, you know, yeah. just because of the time I spent with them. And there's other guys, you know, that obviously were very high ranking up there as well. But when you, when I really step back and look at who put in that time and effort, it was boom. And it's crazy. Like, I, I'm excited. Like, who's it going to be for 2019? Yeah. You know, and it's like, you're your reflection of the of the people you spend the most time with. Yeah. The, the, they say that the top five, yeah, it's, it's oh, true. Sure. I mean, yeah. there's no question about it. And you know, there's been I've had to change the the people I hang out with and spend time with. You know, obviously I saw my best friends out here in Dallas. You know, that's a big reason why we moved here was my buddy Steven, Dane. You know, their families, Me. you because we see each other so often. <laughs> yeah. We hang um, out all the fucking yeah. Time. <laughs> I know. You know, those those guys that you know I've just been super close with over you know the last eight ten years. Yeah. Um, but from growth, you know, it was it was Flynn and Dave, and yeah. it was just I'm so fortunate. That's the thing. I, I don't. I'm not oblivious to the fact that I'm fortunate to be in this position. I'm fortunate to have those guys have poured into me. And now it's cool because I get to do the same with other people. I don't, obviously I'm not at Jocko, Leif, Dave, or Flynn's level, but it's cool. Like I, you know, I got asked to sit on a board of advisors for a foundation that this army vet started. Yeah. And, you know, he's a teacher up in Oklahoma. He has his uh, foundation, No Surrender. And he purchased an old, like, wore out building up in the middle of this small town in Oklahoma where he's a teacher at in the city. And he's tr transitioned it into a rec center for the youth oh, so that cool. kids have a place to go hang out and work out and not get into trouble. And they teach them life skills about, Hey, this is how you brush your teeth. Cause guess what? Your parents have never taught you that. Yeah. And this is how you work out and this is good diet and nutrition. And they're going to have dentists that come in and help out and do all this stuff. Like, so for him to like reach out to me and like ask for advice so that I can help him, like, dude, that's so rewarding, yeah. you know? And so just to kind of help with other people as well, it's just, it's crazy. You know, yeah. um, you know, I learned this from a guy in business a long time ago. Um, you know, you change your friends or you change your friends. Yeah. So, and you always have to be leveling up yeah. you know? and that's, it, people might think, you know, you might being, uh, maybe I'm being an, a, an a-hole, right? You know, by, by, by not hanging out with some of the people I used to hang out with, but I, I have my goals. I know where I need to go in life. I know what I need to do and I have to continuously be level up. And if yeah. you, if you don't have that same mindset and goals for what you want to do in life, I'm sorry, we're on two different paths. It doesn't mean that I don't like you. It doesn't mean that we can't hang out and talk once in a while. But the majority of the time I'm going to spend is with people who are trying to constantly make me better yeah. and push me to be better. Yeah, and sure. that's why I love jujitsu as well. Yeah. No, it's, I mean, it's humbling as fuck. And, and so is, I mean, life is, let's be honest. But no, I agree. I mean, that... I love the saying: If you uh, if you're the smartest person in the room, you're in the wrong fucking room. Yeah, I, you know, like yeah. I mean, always surround yourself with people that are better than you, that are more motivated. You know, whatever yeah. that are just going to push you to to be better. It's it's great advice for sure. I, I am curious. I'm, I'm thinking about when when you came with uh, with I think it was with Aiden to pick the dog yes. up. Was that at that same time? Like was that yeah? Was that just after you kind of came to the your senses, so to speak? Um, no, no, no. So Amanda and I were. Um, 
Yeah, it was it was just after that because I remember, you know, we're all in that small house yeah. and we came to get trigger, and you know, you and I had been you know talking back and forth on social media. And I told Amanda, and I'm like, so, hey, I know. I've got a good idea. You know, I know we're in this <laughs> small house. You know, like, we didn't we didn't have a, a, a dining room because yeah. my desk and we were, you know, had a little office in that area, right? I mean, yeah. we, we ate on TV trays in front of the couch. Like, we didn't have a dining room to sit as a family. We didn't, you know, it was just, and now all of a sudden I'm like, hey, now I'm going to bring home a dog. Yeah. <laughs> and she was like, Shake off oh, head. You gotta be kidding me right yeah. now. But you know, she, you know, my wife knew about you. I talked about you. She, you know, she knew the quality of the dogs that you, you know, you have and you do, and the fact that it would be good for the family. And with me traveling, you know, it's yeah. it's a good thing as well. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it was it was a little bit after that time. <laughs> yeah, uh, I was, as you're you're saying, I'm like, fuck. I wonder if that was the same time. Like, goddamn, that's a that's a hand grenade of a fucking situation in some respects, but. But I love it. Um, yeah. In terms of speaking of leadership, um, one thing that I think would be great for the listeners to hear is, um, is there one lesson that you could say you drew from your combat experiences as it relates to leadership now that, that you pass on? Um, stay humble. I mean, life is, I mean, you just said it. Life is humbling, you know. And if you, if you don't stay humble, you will be humbled. And I like to try to be in control of my environment as much as I can. My life tends to work out better when I'm in control, just like you. You're in control of your environment. Anybody that's listening, if you're in control of your environment, it's always going to be better. Well, if you don't realize that life is going to humble you and it catches you by surprise, it's going to set you back. Yeah. You have to have contingency plans. And that's one of the things I loved about the SEAL teams is we never plan to fail but we had a plan if we were to fail. Yeah. We always had a secondary and tertiary plan, right? Yeah. Now, you don't want to go down that rabbit hole of the what if fairy, right? Yeah. Oh, what if this happens? What if this happens? What yeah. if this happens? No. We always had two to, you know, an extra, you know, we had a secondary and tertiary plan, just like our weapon system, right? I have my primary weapon, I have my secondary. If those both goes down, I have my knife. Yeah. It's going to be real bad if I'm and, pulling and out hand grenades and, and, <laughs> yeah. and, and, and a knife. Yeah. But we had those. Yeah. And guess what? We would use them if we had to. We'd get yeah. trained up on how to use those. Now, do we spend a lot of our time training those? No, because that's not what we're primarily yeah. going to be doing. So focus on your plan. You know, like we say in the in the teams, you know, plan your dive, dive your plan. Yeah. You know, and, and, and just stick to that and and detach. Yeah. You know, and you know, I've seen it on the outside, I've seen egos destroy everything great. I've seen mm -hmm. it destroy families. It destroyed our family, right? And thank God we had it a second chance. I've seen it destroy multi million dollar companies. And you and I have seen guys that could have been great in the SEAL teams, but yeah. their ego. Oh yeah, destroyed them, mm, and everything was taken away from them. Yeah, and now you see guys on the outside who just flat out lie about everything they do because of their ego. Yeah. That's the only reason why they're doing it is their yeah. ego, and so you have to be able to check your ego and be humble. There's always somebody better than you. There's mm -hmm. always somebody smarter than you. There's always somebody that's going to have the upper hand. And so, with that being said, you need to be training. Yeah. You need to, train. whatever you're doing in life, you can train to be better, whether it's reading a book, whether it's studying the market that you're in, whether it's, you know, being a better husband and wife, whatever you can, you can do something to improve yourself. And yeah. so, um, you know, that wasn't just one thing. I tied them all <laughs> together, all but what do they all fall under? Humility. Yeah. And you have to be humble yeah. because. Well, yeah. Cause you're not going to train to get better if you think you're the best, you know? And exactly. If yeah. you don't have humility, you never do a self-assessment. Yeah. And if you can't do an honest self-assessment, you're never going to make the decision to change. Yeah. And, you know, and outside of that, where are you going to do it? It comes from being disciplined. Yeah. So you have to be humble and you have to have discipline. Amen. No, oh, it's all great shit. I love it. Um, moving into the next chapter, uh, I always like to ask kind of a, a what now type of question. I mean, what, um, obviously the, the uh, credentials in terms of what you're doing for Echelon Front uh, essentially speak for themselves, but what, uh, what now? Um, What's 2019 look like for ginormous package? <laughs> 2019 is very busy. I already have stuff on my calendar in October. Oh, shit. Booked out, yeah. 
And it ain't Halloween, folks. Nope. No, no, it's not at all. <laughs> You're quick today. Um, you know, actually, technically, I have stuff in December because we're going to be in Australia in December for the muster. No shit. Yeah, we're doing going a muster down in under Australia. For, yeah. yeah. Speaking um, of which, just a real quick, there's a social media um, supporter of mine from New Zealand. I want to give a shout out to New Zealand. I, uh, awesome. pr- I promised him I'd do that. But Awesome. Anyway, fucking. Well, hey, come on over to Australia and yeah. see us at the muster. What, um, so, but anyway, so 2019 um, is. You know, I'm going to be real heavy on building up our field training exercises. Yeah. Uh, so they obviously, I'm still going to be speaking, doing keynotes, half day workshops, full day workshops, um, joining in on the leadership development alignment program we have. So we have the LDAP. It's where that is. That's a long term strategic strategic partnership that we do with companies where they'll bring us in to do a full on two day assessment. This is what um, Flynn and Dave have really built into mm-hmm. just phenomenal amazing consulting that we're doing with our clients come in and do an assessment and then it's either depending on what their budget is and what and or what they need it's either gonna be a six month nine month maybe up to a 24 month partnership where we're yeah. doing on-site visits skype calls phone calls you know just you know boom 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 doing all that stuff that's so kind of- I, I help with that but that's not my primary focus my primary focus is the ftx's which is the field training exercises that we do and that is To to simplify it, it's just hands-on, stress-induced, scenario-based training where, let's say I'm going to work with your company and you have 20 people and we're going to do a full day or a half day of classroom work where we actually do, we go through extreme ownership, the dichotomy of leadership, all the principles, the laws of combat, the mindsets to victory. We'll do a a self-assessment. We do some, you know, interactive uh, exercises with the people in the room. And then we read you in for what's going to happen the next day. We actually read you in on the mission, what the rules of engagement are, what's, what's going on in that area. And then that next day we're at a facility and we're we're actually doing kicking people in the nuts. Yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> we're actually giving you intel, and you put together packages. Yeah, you know, I'm going to give you an intel package, and you're going to take that package and put together a mission. And you're going to actually going to go out, and you're going to do these capture kill missions against my role players. Oh, and sure. my role players have scenarios that they are going to dictate and drive to help instill the leadership principles the laws of combat and the mindsets of victory that we teach with echelon front. Yeah. Have, so have it's all ever, hands on. And the biggest, most important thing from that is when we come back from the run, we debrief it and we tie it into what they do for business. Yeah. Have you had anything go totally fucking sideways doing any of those things? Mm-hmm. Like has nope. there ever been like a Jesus Christ, what the fuck? Like people that just lose their shit or, or can't handle it or, you know, like any, any- kind of, like kind of, but it's, I mean, it's in a controlled environment. It's an airsoft or we have these laser tag systems that we invested into. Mm-hmm. Like they're, it's insane how the capabilities that we have with these laser tag systems. Um, and so we have had it where it just, it was like everything fell apart, but that's, it's that's also, supposed to. it's supposed to yeah. at what level that depends on the individual. <laughs> yeah. Right. And we have all these parameters where it's like, okay, Hey, we are getting close to, to go on, yeah, we're going close to the point where they're not actually learning anymore. Yeah. Okay, we've reached it. Boom. And we call it and we'll just debrief right then and there. It's almost like the Sear School like training timeout. Like, all right, you're fucking dead. Let's let's pull it back. Yeah, and, and we've had to do that a couple of times. Uh, but it was awesome because they learned, you know, it oh, was yeah. awesome. Like, <laughs> hey, you know what? Stop. And what was cool about it is we did that they brought it back to what they did at work. And they're like, hey, we have stopped the jobs, right? If something is unsafe and something's going downhill, everyone stops what they're doing. Why do we not do that more? Yeah. Why do we not? Because of ego, ego right? Yeah. And the these guys tied it into that. And so the most important thing, what we do is we tie our debriefs into everything that they do. Yeah. Everything that we do ties into what every company we've ever worked with. Yeah. And so that's, I mean, I've got a contract with a client who's going to be 15 weeks 15 weeks of these FTXs. That's 1,500 people we're putting through this training. We do 100 people on Monday in the classroom, and then it's 25 new people on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday throughout the week, and that's all randomly throughout the year. It's not 15 weeks straight, yeah. but I'll be doing that up in Michigan. Jesus. And then we have a handful of other clients there where it's just a two-day thing. Uh, and so that's that's 2019 is building that up to where it's a, just a uh, – just 
a separate department, right? Yeah. Just like our LDAPs are a department, our keynotes and workshops are a department. It yeah. just I building the FTX up to where it's a just a strong foundation for what we do with Echelon Front. Yeah. Um, oh, that's fucking yeah. great, man. Nah, I love it, man. Yeah. It, it's no, great. I mean, it shows. And I mean, those lessons are so it's so powerful and, and impactful and important, you know, not just for us as military guys, but obviously the crossover into business to relationships, coaches with their athletes, you know, husbands and wives, you know, fathers and mothers with their kids. I mean, you name it. Um, it's, it's awesome. It's very rewarding. Yeah. You know, is it fun? <laughs> yes. <Yeah>. It's, <laughs> it's so ridiculous what we get to do, yeah. but the rewarding aspect when you have leaders tell you, you know what? I've been failing my team for the last 10 years. Yeah. This is what I'm taking back to work. This sure. is what I'm going to do tomorrow yeah. to, to, to be better. You know, it, yeah. it's, it's awesome to hear that. And, uh, one of the companies <clears throat> we were working with, um, they're in an industry where they deal with human life like we did in mm -hmm. the, in, in the teams. Uh, and they had an accident and somebody got killed. Well, the leaders of that area had been through our training earlier that week and when the executives showed up on site for this fatality, they said it was 180 degrees to what it had ever been before when oh, sure. an injury and fatality happened. And they said these guys all had everything under control. They owned everything, and they actually told them what they needed to go do. And you know, they said it was completely night and day. Yeah, that's awesome. And if you're familiar with how the union works, not a lot of union individuals like to do more than what they're supposed to or even what they're supposed to or what they're supposed to because they know they're protected <laughs> yeah. and um it wasn't the case with these guys these guys are union yeah and they're like nope i own this but there was no finger pointing there was no blaming and the president of the company was, i'm sorry the ceo of the company sat down with one of the union presidents of that region and said what do we need to do to make sure that this never happens again like yeah. we can't, you know, you can't lose somebody. Like you said, one is one too many, right? Yeah. Somebody getting injured, I mean, that's just not acceptable. And this union president said, we need to go all in with Echelon Front's FTX training. No oh, sure. Because that's going to save lives. And is that the 15 week? Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Sure. And so we've already done four full weeks with them. Now we're doing 15 in 2019. Yeah. And so uh, I don't say that to like pat myself on the back for what we're doing, but just... Like uh, that's what I love. That's why I love what I'm doing is because yeah. when you, that's fulfilling. I guess that's what I'm trying to get to is like yeah. I, it's the closest I've had since the teams is as far as fulfillment, because you know you're you're making a difference. And if we yeah. can take the lessons that you and I have learned overseas, the lessons that our brothers died for, for us to be able to learn, and we can apply it to somebody's personal and professional life, and they can not make the same mistakes. They can be a better husband, a better wife a better father a better mother a better dog a better owner. leader a better dog owner <laughs> yeah. team dog dot yeah. pet yes <laughs> a little fucking shameless plug <laughs> no it's, it, it's yeah anything we do right that's what's that's yeah. what's needed and so yeah. to know that we're able to do that that i'm a part of what echelon front does is is incredible yeah. no i i love what you guys do i mean the the credentials that you guys have the the crew and staff that you have running it speaks for itself i mean it's you know, varsity squad pipe hitters at every level. I, I love what you guys are doing. I'm proud as fuck of all of you. Um, I can't wait to see what, uh, you know, where you guys go in the future and uh, and keeping tabs on that. I I love it. Um, I mean, we're, we also just launched, and we haven't even announced it. And I mean, maybe this might be the first official oh, shit. announcement. Uh oh, might get in trouble. Yeah. Uh, no, we actually have an online training. No shit. Uh, por uh, program oh, being launched. Nice. So yeah. uh, say somebody can't afford to get out to the muster, right? Yeah. Or they can't get to roll call, which roll call is our event that we do for first responders only. Yeah, uh, It's a one-day event. The muster, it's a two-day leadership symposium. It's unlike anything else. Yeah. Uh, we have muster 007 is in Chicago in May. Muster 008 is in um, September. That's going to be in Denver, Colorado. And then Muster 009 is in Australia in December. Yeah. And so... Are you doing any roll calls this year? Uh, well, we have two. We have two that we're going to be doing. You know, we did our first one in Dallas. Yeah. And we have two that's coming up. And so... Um, but let's say somebody just can't get to that or they yeah. can't afford it. Well, guess what? 
we have the online leadership yeah. training program that you can yeah. purchase and go through and yeah, that's um, awesome. you know and then we're also able to sell that you know we're able to bundle that together and you know provide seats for a company so let's say yeah. you have a company and you understand that you know jock or lay for jp or dave coming out and just speaking one time is is going to be good but it's not enough you know, because that's what we tell you. It's not enough. One time hearing it, it's not going to make the difference. Yeah. You know, we'll give you tools and you might apply it, but you, you need that over, you need that consistent message. Yeah. Well, an online program that you can have your guys watch videos, take tests, uh, you know, apply these principles, yeah. you know, join in on webinars and, and, and different calls that we do. Uh, that's powerful. Is that available now? I believe so. <laughs> we're, uh, I mean, this, this, this will actually air fairly soon, but, um, where uh, so where can people find you find Echelon Front if they want to enlist your services um, or just follow? Yeah, echelonfront.com, E C H E L O N F R O N T dot com, echelonfront.com. Uh, and then on social media on um, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, it's at JP Dino. Okay. J P D I N N E L L. And if people want to get uh, Echelon Front involved or you uh, to come speak or whatever, just go to Echelon. If they Front. go to, uh, yeah, and I think they can send an email to info at echelonfront.com. But if they go to the to the website, it'll have all the information. You'll, okay. you'll be able to see all the other instructors yeah. um, and just kind of what we do. It explains the LDAPs, it explains the FTXs. Um, <clears throat> you can go to extremeownership.com and that has the info on the musters and roll calls. Okay, great. Great. But they're all tied together. You go to one, you'll get to the other yeah, one. You can find yeah. It's all, all spider web of connectivity. Yep. Good shit. Um, anything that you want to want to throw out as, as kind of an alibi? Um, well, you know, I just want to thank all of our first responders uh, that are out there laying it out on the line. You know, it's funny when people are thank us for what we do. I'm like, think about the first responders that do it every day. Yeah, every day. Like we deployed a couple times, <clears> right? <throat> Those guys have been on a deployment for 18 years. Oh, no. It's just insane. So our law enforcement and first responders, they they, a, they don't get the, the support that they deserve. They don't get the funding they deserve. They don't get the training they deserve. But guess what? They make it happen. Yeah. And so I just want to thank them for what they do. Uh, obviously, I want to thank Amanda and my kids for what they do for me. They support me being on what we do. And, uh, you know, Jocko and Leif, I say it all the time, but thank you. You know, and I love you guys and, you know, Dave and Flynn and Mike and all those guys, they've really made a huge difference in my life in the last two years. Yeah. You know, and I, I, uh, I mean, two years ago, I was delivering pizzas to make extra money, bro. Yeah. It's fucking nuts. And now like my life is completely different. Like my yeah. kid, you know, it's like, it's amazing. And it's because of those guys, of what they've helped me do, you yeah. know. And obviously also, you know, my parents and Amanda's parents. I mean, her her parents are phenomenal. My parents are as well. And, uh, you know, my, my boys out here in Texas, Dane and Steven, like their families have poured into mine, you know, just sacrificed a lot. And like my buddy Danny I was telling you about. I mean, yeah. like the, if I'm having, if I'm dealing with stuff, he's like, bro, you need me to come to you? And I'm like, you live in Idaho now. Bro. He's like, <laughs> I don't care. I'll drive, you know, yeah. like, you know, just, I just, the support system I have is insane. Like yeah. I don't deserve it. Like I, I'll take it. I'll take it all day long. I just look and I think I'm like, why, you know? Yeah. Um, and then, you know, everyone at my gym and peak, you know, peak performance, you know, my coaches, like, you know, when we started training there, guys were like, Hey, you know, you're new to the area. Like we got a really good church we go to. Do you guys want to come to church with us? And like, just checking in on me, like, Hey man, I know you've been on the road for two weeks. Like, does your family need anything? Does your, you know, the wife and kids need anything? Like, you know, guys would go, you know, guys would gone over and mowed the lawn because I was gone and yeah. made sure like they took the garbage down to the street and brought it back up. And I was just like, yeah. it's, a, it's unreal. Yeah. It is unreal. I am so lucky. So, I mean, I could sit here and thank everybody forever and we it'd be a whole other podcast but yeah. you know at the end of the day uh, i'm very lucky and very blessed to have the people in my life that i have and uh, i mean i hope someone was able to get one thing out of this you know I, i'm never comfortable doing podcasts i, I just I, I don't but you seem pretty comfortable with it because i know if somebody can take something from it it's 100 percent worth it yeah you know if somebody goes and gets their levels checked and that changes who they are awesome yeah. if some veteran decides that they don't need to kill themselves because life gets better if you just get to work and you get back in the fight and you redefine your mission 
It's a hundred percent worth it. I've had veterans reach out to me over the last two years because they listen to different podcasts that I've been on. And I have messages from guys who are like, Hey man, I was going to kill myself this weekend. I listened to your podcast. Is it okay if we communicate back and forth? And I'm like, here's my cell phone. Yeah. Call me. So if that happens, it's hundred percent worth it. Yeah. So I appreciate you having me on here, man. No, Thank you. Dude, I'll tell you, it's a, it's abs. I mean, I say it's an honor and a pleasure. That's the type of people I bring on that it is, and it is. I mean, I'm, I'm honored to have you on. It, uh, it is a, an honor and a pleasure having you here and, uh, and sharing your story with with me and with us. Um, I know you got a busy fucking schedule. It, it is a few hour drive, even living down the street. Texas is <laughs> fucking huge. Yep. Hey, I'm in the neighborhood. Um, you know, so I appreciate you taking the time yeah. and, and, uh, and sharing everything. And one thing, uh, when you're talking about, delivering pizzas it, it does make me think uh, for everybody out there don't take your your pizza guy for granted he may he may be a trained motherfucking killer you, you never know who's delivering your fucking pizza so uh, oh, that's funny. You, you just never or unclogging your shitter apparently but yeah uh, but anyway um before we wrap up one thing um that i want to i want to address real quick i you know i get all these questions about uh you know the dog all, everybody always asking me about dog training stuff go to teamdog.pet Sign up for uh, the online training. Uh, that's why I did it. Uh, same reason you guys are, um, is, is to make it affordable and easy for people to uh, not have to travel and do seminars and, uh, you know, or pay me to come there, you know, for a couple of days or whatever and, and gives you the tools to do it yourself. So teamdog.pet, 99 bucks a year. Choke yourself if you don't. CBD oil, uh, one announcement on the CBD oil, uh, tricosupplements.com. We do have uh human uh flavors now uh so we have 200 milligram chicken still uh, but we've got 500 milligram lemon lime and 500 milligram key lime one of them is an isolate the other is uh, full spectrum so if you are a government employee go with the isolate uh if you are not uh and and you're okay with the trace amounts of thc then do the full spectrum but those are available now we've had people been asking us for a long time uh, we finally have those online and they are for sale currently so check that out you can give that stuff to your dogs also uh, one of the recommendations i'd make the people is just put it on their food um put it in a treat or, or whatever but uh, the key lime or lemon lime uh, they're fine with that also because we've had some people with chicken allergies and some weird responses to that uh, and most people don't like having chicken liver flavored cbd oil, cbd oil under their tongue weird so i i enjoy it i'm a twisted fuck i guess but uh at any rate those are the two announcements i have um last but certainly not least again i'd like to thank you for coming uh, and ultimately the listener uh, if not for you guys i always want to uh, end the show on thanking you guys because you are the reason that i do this uh, and have the platform to be able to bring guys like jp on so thank you to you guys you guys keep crushing it uh, enjoy your days hope you got something out of this and until next time this is mike dropping